Here we got some artists, artists with everybody, right? Yeah. Yeah. Guys right now. All right. Okay, so I think we're going to call this meeting to order. And uh, Judy, would you uh, do the roll call, please? Indeed. Housh? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Hemphlin? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Also present are village manager Patty Bates, assistant village manager Melissa Donald, uh, village solicitor Chris Conrad, and chief of police Brian Carlson. Okay. So I think uh, our first order of business is we've got a couple uh, Arts and Culture Commission members to swear in. I'm going to come down there. And uh, if you guys want to come up here and um, you got your papers, great. And uh, remember you can say swear or affirm. Just one. Okay. All right. So raise your right hand. All right. Uh, I solemnly swear or affirm. I solemnly affirm <laughs> <laughs> that I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution. And will obey the laws of the United States. And will obey the laws of the United States. And the state of Ohio. And the state of Ohio. That I will in all respects. That I will in all respects. Observe the provisions of the Charter and the Ordinances. Observe the provisions of the Charter and the Ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs of the Village of Yellow Springs and will faithfully discharge and will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Arts and Culture Commission the, the duties of the Office of Arts and Culture Commission all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do I get this back to you? You can keep that for a souvenir. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take care. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, and uh, let's move into announcements. Any announcements? Have an announcement, but I'll wait. Yeah, actually, I, I may not have an announcement. I know. So, uh, so Lisa, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd like to um, highlight the uh, Yellow Springs Hall of Fame that's going to be unveiled on February 21st at Mills Lawn Elementary. Um, boy, this must be the arts and culture theme for the night. Um, this was brought to the attention of the Arts and Culture Commission by Dawn Boyer. She's the School District's Director of Advancement and Community Relations. Uh, the Yellow Springs Hall of Fame was accomplished by first graders in Mikasa Sims' class as the culmination of a project, face learning project. And the PBL focused on hidden figures in local African American history. The first graders interviewed 14 local African American change makers. The individuals were photographed by Nan Meekin, and it is those photographs that are now on permanent display as the Yellow Springs Hall of Fame. The African American change makers include Isabel Newman, Pastor Bill Randolph, Jerry Sims, William Simpson, Basim Blunt, Julia Davis, Lillian Slaughter, Phyllis Jackson, Alfred Pierce, Sterling Wright, Kelly Fox, Dr. Kevin Magruder, Dr. John Fleming, and Betty Ford. Thanks to this wonderful project, these individuals will be seen and recognized and not hidden figures at all. This activity, as well as the Dictionary Project, the Blacks and Yellow Springs walking tours, and the Reflections on Race Initiative, help to promote a village where black history, and specifically the black history of Yellow Springs, is not something that we think about just one month each year. And that's important. Thanks. Lisa, what time is that? Uh, uh, four. Oh, I should say. Let me look it up. I think it's early, like four thirty. They're having a PBL celebration. Let me try to find that. Yeah, or I feel like it, I heard one o'clock, but maybe um, one o'clock. Let me try to find it. I know yeah. there's a school uh, presentation at one like one forty-five. Right. Right. Okay, so I'm going with them. <laughs> I have all that detail and not when it starts. It's tomorrow. <laughs> what day is it? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, any other announcements? Um, Judith, did you have? Oh. 
Yeah. All right, actually, I do have a couple of notes. So uh, I did want to mention that next, or this upcoming Sunday, the 25th, um, the uh, Yellow Springs Community Foundation is doing an opening at the, uh, the Winds, right? And um, at least you know, actually know more about this exhibit, I think. I know it starts at 4.30. Um, and what is the... Uh, it does. Um, the Yellow Springs Community Foundation this year decided to uh, take a little bit of a different approach with our annual report. And so we um, developed a, I don't want to call it a contest, but an opportunity for community artists to submit a photograph. And it was called Seeing Our Community. And there were people that sent in photographs, both, um, you know, just adults, and then there's also um, several uh, submissions from kids from the high school that are part of a photography club that were um, selected as the best from the photography club. They're hanging in the winds, we'll be having food, and it'll be kind of the unveiling of some of our ideas for an annual report. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I did want to mention that March 28th is going to be the next meeting for the Active Transportation um, Advisory Committee. So um, we did a kickoff last month and um, at this point, uh, the consultant tool design group has been doing some research, and, um, and then we're gonna kind of get busy. So, um, so it's gonna be exciting. So uh, I could I just add to Lisa's announcement. This uh, is a note that came from the 365 budget. Um, so tomorrow, Black History Month assemblies, uh, both at the high school and the middle school, that's throughout the, the morning, 10:45 to 11:45 organized by the United Society, featuring a panel discussion, and the Ellis Springs High School graduate, Lou Stroger, who's a Nobel Peace Prize uh, recipient, Nobel Peace Prize recipient. Then Mills, Mills Lawn uh, tomorrow, the, at 1.45 to 2.30, will be focusing on hidden figures of the Ellis Springs, including student presentations, and also recognizing Lou Stroger. So, it sounds like 1.45 is the program that we Thank you. Cool. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so next up we have the consent agenda, and actually I do have at least one uh, uh, amendment for the minutes, so I guess uh, I guess we'll pull that off. Um, so the thing I noticed was on page four, um, and it was uh, it's near the top, and it's the reference to. Um, I think it should be the Economic Sustainability Commission uh, focusing on localism, not the EC. Mm. Yep. Oh. So yeah. I think that's what you were saying. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the only thing I noticed. Uh, any other uh, comments about the minutes? Okay, so I'll uh, uh, accept a motion to approve the minutes for February 5th, 2018. I move. Second. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Um, all right, so now uh, reviewing the agenda. So I know one thing that we are adding is a short executive session at the end of this meeting. Um, are there any other things to add or revise related to the agenda? Um, I have something. Uh, the um, February 5th minutes reflect that there was going to be an um, action plan related to utility affordability. And I know that um, there is discussion of the utility roundup scheduled um, as part of old business. So I ask that we have just maybe a few minutes um, as a new business item to dig a little bit deeper into um, utility affordability. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, then uh, um, I guess Mary? I would <laughs> suggest also that we could do it under goals. We could do it either I, time. I was actually going to bring it up under goals. Okay, because I mean I think it relates the most to um, the recommendations that are made um, that are in the packet about the utility roundup. But either place, as long as we talk about it. Okay, well, uh, yeah, because it is a, a goal item, but, um, well, I guess we'll see how the goals discuss discussion goes, mm -hmm. and then if we uh, want to discuss it further. Either. Okay, great. 
Um, all right, Marianne, how about... Just a minute. Yes. about nomination, Jim? Oh. oh, thank you. I would like to nominate a, um, a potential member of the Human Relations Commission, Tim Baum. Um, he's uh, been a resident of the village for uh, just shy of two years. Um, he and his. Well, I mean, wouldn't we would we do that under? Yeah. So normally, when we've got the commission's report out, we just add it to that. So. Okay. Yeah. So we can do that then. Yeah. So when you report out on HRC, we'll do that. Right. And we, so we are doing verbal yep. on all those. Uh, well, we'll do verbal on you know anything that people want to highlight. Okay. Like, I, I think it's great to mention that you have a nomination. So. All right. Okay. Glad cool. that. All right. Anything else? All right, so Marianne, petitions and yeah, communications. Yeah. So, uh, Krista, I don't know if you're here about. Okay, do you want to say something? Um, yeah, sure. I was going to, you might as well say it. Sure. All right, Krista Goff, come to land trust. <laughs> uh, we got a couple exciting days coming up, March 8th and 9th. Uh, that will hopefully get us prepared for uh, our regional conservation partnership that we received to protect more of the Jacoby Greenbelt and to uh, install better conservation practices on the property as well. Um, the 8th is going to be a day really focused on funding sources and we've got some really exciting speakers coming in, including some folks from the Conservation Fund, which is a national organization that has a revolving loan fund for acquisition when you need to kind of move quickly on a property, perhaps such as the experience that we had last year. So um, it's, I'm really looking forward to that. It'll be a chance to really um, get to hear what those folks have to offer, but also to ask them questions and potentially uh, use them as resources in the future. And then uh, the ninth is uh, on regenerative landscapes. <laughs> uh, we kind of took the lead on the eighth, community solutions on the ninth. Um, and they're going to have uh, some great examples of how people have improved soil and conservation values in a variety of different settings. That's pretty um, relevant, I think, to a lot of, of village uh, projects right now, um, not, not only the regional partnership. So uh, it's, it's real affordable. There's a scholarship rate. We would absolutely love to have uh, all of you come to any or part of it. Uh, the information is on the community solutions site and they're doing the registration <coughs> for it. So, um, you know, please uh, feel free to ask any questions, but um, it's a nice opportunity to, I think, bring some really good expertise to our area as we work on rolling out this project. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. We also had uh, communications from NAMI of uh, Third Thursday Education Series. And the first one is March 15th on suicide prevention. <coughs> and you can contact uh, the Clark Green and Madison County NAMI for more information about that. We had a letter uh, from an HRC member, um, Jessica Thomas, that uh, came, actually came directly to Kevin Stokes, concerned about um, Existing rental properties, accessibility to rental properties, uh, landlord responsibility, and issues regarding um, Section 8 housing. And I'm going to stick this in with my notes on when we're thinking about housing. Okay. Uh, then the chief get, sent us something which I had never heard of, 211, which is a United Way project, I guess. <coughs> so you can phone. 211, or um, you can text it or get it on the United Way website. And they have services that answer a lot of questions. <laughs> I mean, I guess, like if you're looking for a therapist or need help finding a job or different things. So I guess you can call up and find out what they can do. Then, lastly, the treasurer, our treasurer, submitted a report mostly about um, the interest that we're receiving uh, compared to the fees that we pay on our um, uh, investments and our we are receiving more now since uh, 
that she has moved some of the money and she uh, will continue to look at and suggest ways to keep our investment so that we get the best return that's allowable legally. And that, Marianne, yes. Oh, okay. Um, so the Environmental Commission, uh, and, and in, the, in the person of uh, Nadia Malarkey, is um, organizing a day of uh, workshop and then a, an evening talk on March 1st, transitioning to organic lawn care. So in a way, it's sort of like for residents what the Council Land Trust and Community Solutions are doing uh, rurally and farmland and, and uh, riparian areas. Uh, so it's March 1st. Uh, you can uh, uh, contact Patty Bates mm -hmm. to register for the day-long workshop, which is uh, being presented by some national uh, people coming in to do this presentation. And then the evening uh, is op also open to the public. You have to register for the day long, but the evening is open to the public, and uh, that it will be at Antioch Midwest at 7.30 on yeah. March 1st. It, the, the day, the one during the day is geared uh, quite a bit towards uh, professional landscapers, turf managers, um, those kind of people, and then the evening one is geared more towards homeowners who want to make the move towards more organic uh, lawn care. So um, just contact me about either session. So, and I guess before we move on, <clears throat> Patty, can you respond to what Jessica Thomas raised about um, her landlord saying that they aren't responsible for shoveling the sidewalk? Um, I can or Chris can because we actually had this discussion. We had another complaint from a business owner downtown, um, and there is actually a, uh, a law um, case, a lawsuit that says that um, landlords are not responsible to clear naturally accumulating ice and snow. <laughs> Um, because Chris and I actually went back and forth about what was naturally accumulating. And um, it, I think the difference, and Chris, please jump in here if I get this wrong, uh, the difference is that if once someone walks over accumulated ice and snow, packs it down, and makes it a little bit more slippery, then it becomes an unnatural situation. Chris, is that my understanding of that? Well, he's trying to see if I can now. find the email that I sent, which I probably won't be able to do since I'm under the gun. But essentially, the Supreme Court ruled, I think, back in 2009, um, based upon lawsuits that were being filed because property owners would go and shovel the snow. And the Supreme Court ruled, as Patty indicated, that naturally accumulating formations of ice and snow um, are not required to be removed. Um, if they are removed and a unnatural condition uh, were to occur, then in theory that could lead to liability exposure. Whether it does or not is a question of fact that gets litigated. So the so melting snow, the, or if you salt the property, you salt the grounds and it refreezes, that could be naturally occurring. It just depends on what those circumstances are. So <clears throat> what this landlord told Jessica uh, allegedly was accurate? Well, I'm not going to get into specifics of okay. that because that's subject to interpretation of what that discussion was. All I can say is, and I'd be happy to give the case to Judy and she can put it on the website if she wanted, but there the Supreme Court has ruled that, again, natural accumulations of ice and snow um, there's, doesn't, don't create a duty of a property owner to remove it. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. All right, thanks. Yeah. Before we go on, can we receive and file the communication from Pam Nicodemus? Well, it came in. The way that that's handled generally, I think, is that we will bring it up the next one. The next one? Okay. It came in after this. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well let's move on to public hearings and legislation. And uh, we first of all have Ordinance 2018-04, which is our second reading. Uh, Judy, can you read that in by title only? 
Yes, this is Ordinance 2018-04, approving creation of a fund for utility overpayment and disbursement. Okay, I'll entertain the motion. So move. Second. Okay. Um, so, uh, Melissa, you want to briefly tell us what this is about? Yeah, what this fund is for is um, with the conversion to the new utility billing software that we anticipate happening next week, um, this is creating a fund so that anybody that pays an overage on their bills, um, which we have a lot of people that do that, um, if, if a bill is $190, they might pay uh, $200 just to round it up. Um, and that extra money in the past with our current software that we're moving away from would just all go into the electric fund. So it ended up the electric fund was slightly overstated because of that. Um, it's just the way that the system was set up a long time ago and it's just remained that way. So our new software has the capability of parsing that out and um, putting it into a holding fund, which is the, the fund that we are creating with this uh, legislation. And then when somebody's next bill um, gets entered into the system, then that overage would be distributed more evenly to go out to all of the funds versus just staying in the electric fund. So that's what that is. So anytime we create a new fund, it has to be an act of uh, council through legislation. So that's what this is. Okay. All right. So this is the second reading. So I'll open the public hearing. Any <laughs> questions or comments from citizens? Any questions or comments from council? All right, Judy, you want to call the roll? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Humphrey? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Housh? Yes. Okay. And now on to 2018 05. Uh, and Judy, same thing, if you could read that in by title only. Yes, this is approving creation of a fund to house revenues obtained for the Yellow Springs Clifton Connector Trail Project. Melissa? Okay, so what this is, is this is another. Um, another creation of a fund which of course requires the approval of uh, council to do so um, it, it has been decided that the village of Yellow Springs would be the um, the holding the holding um, entity for any funds that come in to support the uh, Yellow, Spring, Yellow Springs Clifton connector trail project so I think that initially there's going to be some um, needs yeah. assessment done and then if there would be any construction as a result of that, then the village would hold the money until it would be released for uh, those purposes. Okay, great. Um, I'll entertain a motion to uh, move. Second. Okay. Um, and again, this is the second reading, so uh, I'll open the public hearing. Any questions or comments from citizens? Questions or comments from council? All right. Judy? Krieger? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Hempfling? Yes. Housh? Yes. Okay, and finally we have Resolution 2018-03, and uh, Judy, if you would, read this in full. Indeed. <clears throat> this is supporting preservation of Ohio's waterways on the occasion of the 50th, 50 year anniversary of the Scenic Rivers Act. Whereas Ohio became a pioneer in the river preservation movement with the passage of the Ohio Scenic River Act of 1968, the nation's first Scenic Rivers Act, which created a program to preserve and protect rivers throughout our state. And whereas Ohio's rivers, creeks, and streams provide locally accessible natural resources for environmental learning, wildlife appreciation, and recreational opportunities as water trails. And whereas Ohio has approximately 60,000 miles of rivers and streams throughout our state, including our own 111-mile Little Miami State and National Scenic River, a critical watershed that is home to a wide variety of flora and fauna, is noted for its breathtaking vistas and flows along the Glen Helen Nature Preserve, that became Ohio's first designated state scenic river on April 23, 1960. And was the first Ohio stream to also be designated as a national scenic river. And whereas the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and the Ohio Envi Environmental Protection Agency have been essential partners in the effort to ensure the safety and protection of Ohio's water resources. And whereas 2018 marks the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Ohio, C Ohio Scenic River Act and provides an opportunity to reflect on the progress that has been made to protect our state's scenic rivers and a chance to reaffirm our local commitment to preserving and protecting Ohio's natural resources so that they can be enjoyed and experienced by future generations. Now therefore be it resolved that Section 1, on this 20th day of February 2018, the Village of Yellow Springs does hereby recognize the 50th anniversary of the Ohio Scenic River Act and encourages all villagers and visitors to join in the celebration of five decades of commitment to protecting our state's wild and scenic rivers. Okay. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to uh, bring 
forward. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, and I just want to, the only thing I want to add to this is that uh, if anyone is interested, there is a celebration on February 28th from 3.30 to 5 at the State House. And uh, um, the Scenic Rivers Committee is inviting everybody to come and, and join uh, to celebrate this 50th anniversary as well as the uh, Year of the Trails, which is what... 2018 is going to be designated next week. So, uh, so with that, um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, uh, at this point in the agenda, we have citizen concerns. So, anything that is not an agenda item, we welcome people to come up to the mic and speak for no more than three minutes. All right. I think we do not have any citizen concerns, so let's move on to special reports. And Melissa, I believe you're going to tell us uh, how we're doing financially. Yeah. So I put a, um, Judy, if you could uh, hand me the, thank you. I'm going to try to hide this <coughs> individual. Here we go. Okay, there's one right here. Okay, let us, let us get set up over here. Actually, it might just be on the other side. <coughs> Okay, we'll try this. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do first is, um, I don't have an extensive PowerPoint. I honestly just um, put some of these together. Um, just for, just for uh, visual, for the discussion, um, just with the revenues. Um, so I've got the uh, fourth quarter financial statement highlights that are in front of everybody. So what I did, and again, I'm gonna preface all of this with, this is only the second time that I've had to do this because with uh, the 2016 audit, the auditors, um, the auditors had actually it was the 2015 audit. I think uh, they had indicated that council needed to um, view the financials on a regular basis and um, approve those. And so what we were doing was we were putting those in each of the packets. I was putting all of the reports. And um, the recommendation was, why don't we just spend a little bit more time, do this less often? And so we went to quarterly reports. So the first one that we did was in October. And so this is going to be the second one. And I've been doing a little research on, um, you know, council seemed favorable as to what I'd presented the last time, but I'd been doing a little more research on um, kind of what other people are doing in terms of presentations and kind of trying to pick what I thought might work um, based on what I'd seen other other municipalities doing. So I think I'm going to revamp this for when I do the first quarter. Um, I'm going to have a little more charted information, I think. I think that the narrative is important because it puts all of the numbers that are in the reports into um, into uh, words that uh, are into a narrative that I think that everybody can can follow fairly easily so um, that's that's what I still did um, with this submission in this packet so we've got the fourth quarter financial statement highlights which is in the packet and then I've also got the expense report the revenue report and the statement of cash from revenue expense report so the statement of cash from revenue and expense report is is one of the probably first first reports that I would want council to pay attention to because it's almost kind of the Reader's Digest version. It has a roll up of all of our funds. It has uh, the beginning balance at the beginning of the year. It also has uh, the revenue, all of the revenues for the year, all of the expenditures for the year, and then it will have an ending balance. Um, and then next to the ending balance there are what are called encumbrances. So any of the purchase orders that we open up that money is withheld um, as committed and therefore it is encumbered and it is reflected on this report as an encumbrance. So that money is committed um, but you know not not at all times is all of that money spent. Um, so it's just a, a view of the money that we've committed uh, to spend in the future and then we have a um, we have an unencumbered balance or an encumbered balance. So <laughs> That is a great two-pager, not even a full two pages of uh, where the village is and just kind of a good snapshot for the year. So I think that that's, that's probably one of the most helpful reports that, that I submit. There's also the, the full revenue and the full expense report. So especially for new council members that aren't used to seeing these, 
that's a really good way to kind of take a deep dive into the finances and be able to look actually down to the line level in each of the departments and everything on the expense side. Uh, the revenues are a little simpler. It's a, it's a much uh, smaller report because there aren't near as many revenue sources as there are expenditure lines. So as always, I'm always willing to, to take time to um, you know spend with any of the council members that, that would wish to take a deep dive into any of that. So, so that is the three reports and the highlight that you are seeing in your packet. Um, I've got up here the general fund re revenues. So this is, this is a nice graphic just to show you where all of the money in the general fund comes from. So just a reminder that the money that comes into the general fund is money that's flexible. We have the capability to move that out to any of the other funds that might need support. Um, we commonly do that with uh, capital improvement funds. Parks and Recreation Fund, uh, Street Repair and Maintenance Fund, any of the funds that don't have enough income or an income at all in which to support themselves comes from the general fund. So it's it's a really important fund in terms that in terms of uh, supporting not only all of our departments um, that are not enterprise uh, enterprise fund departments, but it's also able to, to support a lot of the initiatives within the village that just doesn't have enough money to sustain itself. So the general fund revenues, as you can see, the income tax takes up the majority of that at 52% of our revenues. And these were taken from the actual figures from the end of 2017. Our property taxes are 26%. And then um, we have pretty much 11% or less comes from our miscellaneous receipts, uh, state taxes and permits, kilowatt hour tax, and then our fines and costs, which basically come from the Mears Court and some small things that come from Xenia Municipal Court as well. So that's our general fund revenues. And then um, here's a chart just to show you how our enterprise revenues are split. Um, I'm gonna try to make this just a, a little bit bigger for you guys. So our enterprise funds, um, as you can see, the revenues, 63% of the revenues that we bring in are from our electric fund, and uh, 16 water, 16 sewer, and then 5% solid waste. And this is almost a direct correlation of what people's bills actually look like when they get them. Um, we are one of the you know few mun municipalities in the area that actually has everything all on one bill, which you know can contribute to some sticker shock at times. But you have to think um, they are getting every single one of their services, with the exception of their you know internet or cable or anything like that, on one bill. Which not very many people have that all on one bill like we do. So this is a breakdown of our enterprise fund revenue. So. Just to go back and kind of hit on some of the highlights um, from the narrative that I typed up, um, the revenues, um, overall, I think that 2017 was a great year. Um, we had a lot of, uh, a lot of um, unexpected things happen on the revenue side and less unexpected things that happened on the expense side, which is always a positive. We were approximately $333,000 higher than what I had originally budgeted for at the beginning of uh, 2017 in general fund revenues. So that could be attributed to the sale of Sutton Farms, some increased income taxes, the investment interest, which was noted earlier, and some minimal rental fees. Um, our expenses were originally budgeted at $3,011,746, 3 and we ended the year just uh, slightly higher with 3,289,416. So there were um, the needs assessments that we did, we had some increased legal fees, but overall it wasn't a, a huge increase, um, but there, there were a few more expenditures than what we had um, anticipated for on the general fund side. Um, one of the big um, contributors to that, which I should note was as a result of those increased revenues that we brought in, we did move some money out to the uh, Facilities Capital Improvement Fund, and I think we moved 400000 out. So if you kind of extrapolate that from there, um, we actually ended the year with less expenditures than what we'd hoped for. So that's a good thing. Um, but if you just kind of look at the bottom line, it kind of looked like we spent more, but we brought in more, so we were able to allocate some funds out um, to the Facilities Improvement Fund. And so um, at the end of the year, we were able, even with that large transfer out to the Facilities Improvement Fund, we were able to add $224,000 to our uh, reserves. So that's approximately 400000 above what our minimum should be. So we're doing pretty good with the general fund.
Um, so I didn't go through all of the smaller uh, funds like the special revenue funds because there's just not a whole lot of activity that, that uh, happens in those funds. Um, most of the revenues are supported by the, the general fund transfers in and the expenditures are relatively stable. We don't really see a whole lot of unexpected things that happen within like the parks and recreation or uh, streets. Um, we didn't have any major repairs that were unexpected. So I just jumped right into our um, enterprise funds because pretty much the general fund and the enterprise funds are the ones that we really just need to keep a, a close eye on. So um, the electric fund, I will preface this with, um, the electric fund is a very tricky one in which to try to budget for because everything that, um, everything that we spend is based on our power costs, which tend to fluctuate depending on what happens with our portfolio. And so as a result of those fluctuating expenses, um, we have a power cost adjustment which is added on to, um, added on to our, our um, bills that we send our customers in order to recoup that extra cost. And so whenever our expenditures go up, our revenues go up right along with it because that power cost adjustment recoups that extra cost. Um, it's kind of the same thing that you'll see in our solid waste fund. Um, if you look at your, if you look at your bill, um, well, actually, if you look at the breakdown, I have a, a nice breakdown on our website where you can plug in your kilowatt hour usage, your uh, your ga thousands of gallons per month. Um, you can put in your trash tier and things like that. And I update that every single month with like our power cost adjustment so you can make sure that your bill's calculating correctly. You can see how it's calculated. Um, but the solid waste fund, it also has a fuel surcharge because gas, gas prices fluctuate. So we have to account for that as well. So even though your tier may be $13 a month, um, your bill might actually be, you know, fourteen dollars and fifty cents because of that fuel fuel surcharge. So the electric fund is the same. The same in that regard is, you know, the costs kind of fluctuate for our power in, based on our portfolio. So um, the electric fund, you know, we spent more in the electric fund, but we also brought in more in the electric fund than what we had um, budgeted for because of those power costs. Um, the majority of the electric fund just is the consumer fees and our, and our cost of power. Um, what it costs to operate that department is very minimal um, in terms of the money that we spend in our actual power costs. So the electric fund, um, it had an ending balance approximately $500,000 higher than the beginning of the year. Um, we did have a lot less uh, transfers that were made out. We had a very large transfer that was made out of the electric fund last year because as council may remember, we did not we had not been moving money out to capital improvement funds until last year. We really started to, to make that a priority. So this year, it was a very conservative approach in the electric fund, and we probably could have moved a little bit more out of there. So um, that's something that I'm going to keep an eye on this year to possibly maybe have another larger transfer that moves out to our improvement fund so that it support that infrastructure. So the water fund, um, the water fund, the revenues were only $7,000 short of what was originally budgeted for 2017, which is pretty good. And so there was another 30% increase at the beginning of, beginning of 2017. Uh, the water fund is one in which I keep a very close eye on. Um, I was I was a little nervous because it looked like the revenues weren't exactly going to uh, match what was budgeted, but we only fell $7,000 short, which is pretty good. So. We brought in 967,507 in the water fund on the revenue side. And then our expenses were approximately $750,000 less than what was originally budgeted. So that was good. So the end of uh, 2017, we were at, able to add an additional $220,000 into reserves. So we have an un unencumbered fund balance of 581,855, which is nearly double what our reserves should be at this point. However, we were doing this because we are going to have the, the water plant payments in full that begin in 2018. Um, we did have, I think, 100, it was 130,000 or so um, worth of water plant payments that did come out at the end of 2017 that we weren't expecting. So we were able to add some to reserves in 2017, but in 2018, 
a lot of that addition is going to be eaten away by our debt service payment to the water plant. So that's why we had to do these rate increases was try to build that up a little bit to anticipate those payments. Plus, we all know that the infrastructure um, with the water distribution system is aging, so it's important that we continue to build those reserves and build those capital improvement funds with water, which we haven't been able to really do because we've been so committed to getting the water plant going and figuring out what our debt payments are going to be. So the water fund is doing, doing decently right now. Uh, the sewer fund brought in $30,000 higher than budgeted, so they brought in um, almost a million dollars. It also seen a rate increase of 15% at the beginning of 2017. And the expenditure side, they were approximately $13,000 lower than what was budgeted. And then the easiest fund of them all is our solid waste fund because it's pretty much a clean in and out. We have a contract with Rumpke. Consumer fees go out to, to support that contract that we have. Um, but our reserve in that fund was very low uh, three years ago. I think that we only had $12,000 in that fund, and that wasn't even enough to make one month's uh, worth of our payment out to Rumpke. So at this point, we've been able to build the reserves, and we've got a fund balance, an unencumbered fund balance at the end of 2017 of 59000 So that's almost enough to cover, well, that is enough to cover approximately three months' worth. So that's exactly where we should be with our, our garbage. And Melissa, is that also where the the uh, weekend pickup, the special pickup that we do in May yes. with the large items? Yes. Um, that's, that's a cost that... Um, <coughs> The, the spring cleanup, that's a cost that the village absorbs. It, it runs approximately six to $7,000. Uh, they, they base it all off of weight. So um, that's a cost that the village absorbs. So having those reserves there to be able to, uh, to account for that is also important in the solid waste fund. So overall, the village began the year with approximately 6.7 million across all funds and at the end of year, at the end of 2017, we ended the year with uh, 7.9 million, and we had 1.1 million in encumbrances, which brought our unencumbered fund balance to 6.7 million. So we were approximately $3,000 higher across all funds than what we were at the beginning of the year. So we weren't in the red, we were in the positive, so that's a good thing. And yeah, so that's my highlight. So I will take any you know feedback from that. Like I said, this is kind of a work in progress, and I've been doing some research on some other uh, reporting, which is, you know, I've, I've, seen some, I've seen some better ways to do it, so I'm constantly going to try to improve this thing so that it fits the needs of council. So, that's Melissa, that. can you just uh, emphasize when you talk about the right amount being in the funds, like what your threshold is? Yeah, the guideline is typically three months' worth of operating, and what I do is I try to brace for four months just because it, I tend to take a more conservative approach with everything. As, as you know, when, when I go through the budget, I usually tend to understate the revenues and overstate the expenses just because it just makes me more comfortable in that way because I, I try, to, try to brace for that because you never know what's going to happen. So I try to brace for um, our reserves to have at least uh, four months worth of operating in them. And we are looking good across all funds, finally. So I feel good about it. Good. What, do we, are we working on a capital improvements uh, plan for each of the, um, of our uh, utility funds or enterprise funds? You know, we're, we're saving money for, you know, to meet those needs. And I guess I'm just wondering where we're at with plans about what those needs are and how that money. Well, we do not have an, we, we do need an extensive capital plan. Um, but since last year, I believe it was last year, it could have been 16, it was the first year that we started even moving money into those funds, we didn't have anything to work with. So, and we didn't move anything into water until last year. And I think that there had been, Thirty thousand dollars, thirty-two thousand, I think, that were were in that capital improvement fund up until we moved. I think fifty thousand into it. So, the distribution system, the water distribution system, I know is in need of a plan, but the funding is the issue, and we just don't have the funding um, in our capital improvement funds at this point to be able to do that. Um, the only real fund that we could do some 
some extensive planning with or begin to do that would be the electric fund because it's it's got reserves that are built up that could actually tackle some significant projects it, and we have started talking about what those projects may have to be in the electric fund um, Johnny and I've been talking about a third circuit um, because right now the village runs on the east circuit and the west circuit and um, we need a third circuit and so that would be a major expense and we also do have when we do the budget Melissa um, we ask everybody to put in what do you want to do in the next five years um, so that at least we have five years worth of uh, projections of what we're going to need in each of the funds um, but other than that Melissa is correct we do we do need to create extensive capital improvement plans but up until I know I think it was 16 that we started doing that um, we didn't have anything to work with and so you know now's now's the time to really get started on on creating those more extensive plans I have a question about solid waste. You said something about being based on poundage. Mm -hmm. Can you say? Yeah, the way that our solid waste is structured is we're on a tiered system. So the less waste that you put out for pickup, the less that you're charged. So everything that gets billed is they they do they do weigh everything. And I think that that gets played into our billing somewhat. I know that they count the number of customers in tiers, but they also provide us with the number of tons each month that is produced by the village. The, the reason why I'm asking is because uh, there, there are a couple of people who are uh, starting to put forth an idea of having a community compost mm -hmm. facility. If people contributed to that, that clearly would decrease the poundage of their mm -hmm. waste. So I'm wondering if that would translate mm -hmm. into lower garbage costs by Rumpke. I can I can look into that because their bills are very basic, and I know that they they must provide us with the tonnage for more of a purpose than to just know how much weight worth of waste that we're producing. So. Right. Yeah, that would be helpful because that yes, would I can definitely yes. look into that. But, but the way, just so everyone understands, the way the contract is written right now is based on essentially how many garbage cans you put out, not including your recycling bin. Um, so one can is a tier one, two cans are tier two, three cans tier three. Um, so while it is measured and weighed, and there is, I think, an additional surcharge for that in addition to the fuel charge. Um, for the it's called a, a dump a dump fee um, but um, the tiers that we actually charge people are based upon essentially how many and what size cans you put out um, and I think when Melissa was talking about the tonnage that was on the large item pickup uh, spring cleanup I know there's a I know they wow. they measure our tonnage every month because they send us how much we recycle as opposed to how much we pick up and there is a dump fee based on the tonnage so there's that surcharge but we still are going to have to pay the charges in the contract for the tiers now the thing that could happen is that if someone um, contributes to the community compost that will lessen the tier, and maybe they go from a tier yeah. two to a tier one, and they could call up the office and change that and get charged less. So in that way, it could possibly benefit. And just a correction, the tiers aren't the number of cans, it's the size. Yeah, the size of the cans, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. I have a couple comments. First, I wanna say, I really appreciate having all this information and the narrative data I think is particularly um, helpful you know because to me when I you know the purpose of these numbers for me is for you know decision making mm -hmm. and and to use the finances to understand and evaluate and modify revenues so that we can make progressive policy mm -hmm. so you know if that's the work this does um, and I think with finances, no one likes a surprise. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. 
right? We don't like them personally and the village doesn't want them. And, you know, particularly as I think about utilities and looked at, you know, the sewer and the water fund, I think having more frequent financial reporting, um, particularly given the high num amount of unencumbered balance and uh, reserves, um, will help us as a community to understand risks mm -hmm. so that we can avoid surprises of either a big jump or, you know, how do we, how do we handle that and avoid those surprises. Um, I, I have seen some reporting in the past where, uh, like an alert is set when you start to reach, um, you know, some percentage of, comp of spend mm -hmm in a fund, and you set that, I mean, that's an arbitrary number you decide. So, you know, because some things, you don't just say, oh, if you're six months in and it's 50%, you're cool. It doesn't really work that way because some expenditures are not evenly spread across the year. Mm -hmm. But I think it could be helpful so that when you're approaching a percentage completion that's higher than what you might want it to be, that it sends up some sort of alert that we talk about why is it going to 120%? Why is it ending up 200% of what was forecast just for decision making? Um, the, the only other thing I wanted to bring up, um, as I looked at this, I recalled that during the uh, council campaign season, um, and when we were talking about affordability, there was some discussion about having a living wage, you know, paid in the village. And that a way to start that would be to ha be certain that everybody who worked for the village was earning a living wage so that they could afford to live in the village if they, if they wanted to. And I, I just was wondering, you know, the way, um, the way this report's done, uh, wages are disaggregated across a variety of different funds. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered if um, there was any kind of trend data or any analysis has been done about salaries in, in the village and you know, if we do feel that there, we're meeting that, is that something we would ever wanna take on, talk about living wage for village um, employees and you know, that was just kind of food for thought that I thought of as I was looking at this report. Um, those are my comments. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think I want to add to, yeah, this, uh, I particularly like this uh, three page summary. It's very digested and understandable. It's great. Um, one thing I wanted to say in terms of the electric fund, because, you know, we've got a pretty large fund there, and so some people could view that as we're overshooting. Uh, what we're charging people. One thing that um, Johnny said uh, at the energy board meeting that I hadn't heard before, and Patty was kind of alluding to this, you know, in terms of this notion that we need a third circuit, is that with Cresco coming in and with us talking about housing development, we're actually going to have to spend money on the, our electric infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I hadn't really heard that before, mm -hmm. and so. I guess I just want to say it out loud here um, to draw attention to, you know, with development comes cost. And, you know, we were talking a little bit about, well, so, you know, what, what part of that cost do develop, does the developer, the, the developments uh, bear? What part does the village bear? Anyway, that's uh, just not a piece of information that I had until I heard him talk about it there so I thought I wanted to make that say that publicly uh, and but I do think we also should be thinking about you know if at any point it looks like we are overshooting our goals in a way that you know we could consider reducing you know I, I don't know I know generally that's not where people want to think want to think but that we should keep that in mind that if we find that we're kind of overshooting our needs uh, that we should be willing to think about reconsidering and <laughs> changing our rates in a downward direction if, if that's possible. Well, we don't want to be going back and forth, you know, because mm -hmm. there's actually all this infrastructure need that we haven't thought about or something like that. But yeah, it's a great report. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>
So, I mean, I think to wrap, to close the loop on what um, Judith just indicated is it's probably important to get that plan together for the electric infrastructure mm -hmm. soon so that we can justify, mm -hmm. you know, what we have in that uh, fund. I actually was talking to Johnny about it today, and he's hoping to get AMP out here to get an analysis of exactly what we need to do. Okay. So. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right. So I think we're going to move into old business, and we are going to pick up our goals discussion um, from our last meeting. And uh, I will just briefly uh, say what I did. I took everybody's comments and tried to uh, capture those in what now is, is eight goals. Um, and uh, so I think the nature of this discussion is to see what sort of adjustments we want to make. And then um, it sounded like there was consensus around putting these out there in that Facebook group and, um, and potentially a survey monkey and some other like, boxes around town. So I want to talk a little bit about the logistics of that. Um, so uh, saying that, I'll... Uh, Open up the discussion. Marianne? I'm going to jump in. Jump in. Um, <coughs> well, I think a lot of work needs to be done on these goals. <coughs> Some of the goals are so general, I hardly, well, they certainly aren't doable in, in uh, 2018, and they're, they're so general that uh, I wouldn't necessarily call them a goal. Um, so I, I think we really need to hone in on just about every single goal that's listed. But the other thing that I feel pretty strongly about is that we should organize the goals in terms of the ones that we think are most critical as well as the ones that council or staff are going to be doing a lot of work on. Yes. And in that regard, I would suggest that the three goals that I think are most critical are affordability, which really needs to be honed in on. And I actually would like us to consider re-looking at our utility rates <laughs> in that regard, as well as working with the township and the school board <laughs> to at least discuss affordability. Housing is the second goal that I think is most critical. And the third, which is not exactly listed here, but we've just sort of been talking about, is our infrastructure. Both, and it, with the infrastructure, I would include what, well, both the CLAP capital improvement plans, but an assessment of our infrastructure, specifically water and sewer, but I guess also electric. And in 2018, I wouldn't expect that certainly the improvements would be made, but I'm thinking 2018 we could at least assess the conditions of the, all of the infrastructure, in particular water, sewer, and electric, and what would need to be done. Um, so um, that, that, that is my general comments. I mean, there's so much here that it it's going to take more than 25 minutes if we really wanted to dig down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, they're definitely not in, in priority order, that's for sure. Um, I mean, I, I will make one comment. I do want to distinguish between, I do think a goal should be outcome-based as opposed to, you know, th this is a different structure than what we had in the past. 2018 actions are the things that, I, I guess uh, based on the comments that we talked about, things that we could accomplish this year. Um, but anyway, you know. Okay, so are you saying a goal could be a multi-year goal, even if it's not the same? <clears throat> right. I mean, I, to me, it seems, you know, as, as I listened to our last conversation, it seems strange to me to, like, just only talk about 2018 and not look at what we ultimately want to have happen. And so that's, and that's the way, um, based on the feedback that I put these together, but it's the second, or I guess the third column that I think is the focus on what we're gonna do this year, 
and then also tracking who's going to do that, you know, in terms of capacity. Um, well, I support uh, Mary Ann's focus on housing. We've already agreed that that's a high priority. Affordability has definitely risen to the surface. It's not just coming from this table, but from our community very strongly. Um, but I do want to say that, um, you know, last year we made a big focus in the last, uh, maybe it's been two years, on justice system uh, reform, and I and it's it's related to many of our other goals, um, I think, um, and to narrow it down to these kind of the, the you know that third goal around the infrastructure, I think is. It's important to start moving forward on that, but I, I just I don't see making that the major focus of staff time uh, to the to the exclusion of other things that we're in the process of working on. So, um, you know, I I don't think we've got an emergency about our infrastructure. Uh, we do you know need to start you know sounds like staff is already thinking about the electric system, which given that we're for, but it's actually quite really connected to the housing goal. <laughs> um, uh, and so I think we're just sort of becoming aware of that fact, or at least I am. And uh, the community, my guess is, <coughs> hasn't heard that. And so they did, you know, they're just going to begin to understand that. Um, well, and, and so I don't want to suddenly turn away from the work we've been doing. And, you know, it's no longer a focus. I, I, so. I didn't. And I don't know if you meant it that way. Okay. But it just, anyway. All right. So that's all. And I think the other thing to remember as we talk about the, the utilities is, again, that the EPA is going to make us do something with our distribution system. They have made it clear to us that we are going to have to do some serious and extensive upgrades to our distribution system. And so we are just now getting to the point of those discussions because the water plant is up. They wanted to wait for the water plant to be up and online. So we're just now getting to the point of those discussions with the EPA. So we don't know exactly what that's going to entail yet. So um, while, I, while I understand and appreciate very much the discussions about wanting to re-look at the utility rates, I think that we need to also remember that they're going to make us do something. Until we know what that is, we have to be very careful. And I guess my thought is, in terms of the EPA, I, I feel like we, we're being very responsible about taking care of our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And I would guess we're in better shape than most communities. So I don't know if that, that seems to me likely. I, maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, there's a lot of communities out there who you know, because there's been so little state and federal monies put in this direction for so long and they've just kind of left it to the local mm -hmm. governments and so. Yeah. I, I just want, I just want council to be aware that, that again, that that's coming. I mean, we've mentioned it before, but mm -hmm. you know, we need to keep that in mind. So. I'll chime in. Um, you know, there's no right or wrong number of goals to have. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I feel like in terms of a general number, you know, seven or eight is reasonable. It's not like there's, you know, 15 of them. Um, I, I agree that um, we, we could probably uh, spend some time, you know, tuning this up. And, and I recall when we had our retreat, earlier in the year that there was some, we had a fairly short amount of time in retreat. And I, I remember then, I mean, I was kind of, you know, it was like, I was weeks in, so I went in early. I better recall that we had said this was like half of a full retreat because we only found a certain amount of time. So perhaps uh, the second half of that retreat is merited um, at this point to continue to focus on goals without other business um, on the plate. Um, it, it, I, um, I, I really don't disagree with, with what's been said. Um, uh, Marianne, it's interesting because I, you know, reading through these resources, I found it was notable that the school board was not 
you know, part of the resources. And I think that anything that we do that has any, I mean, there's a couple of areas with affordability and, you know, a couple of the goals where I think it's really critical for us to continue to find ways to uh, ha understand so that we, everyone knows what, what everyone else is doing and be more affiliated and build our relationship with that body. Um, I, I guess this is also more specific, but I noticed that in the goal related to the justice system, um, the 365 project wasn't identified as uh, as one of the resources, and I think they they definitely are. Yeah. Um, and then, as it relates to affordability, um, I have some very, uh, I guess they're not very specific, but more specific actions um, related to um, utilities that we could talk about about now as part of goals or or later as new business. Up to the everyone. I kind of feel like it works better in new business because it sounds more it sounds more immediate ideas. Mm -hmm. That makes more sense to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I will weigh in also <clears throat> I would certainly echo um, most of what's been said. In terms of the number of goals, I think um, I don't think we. I don't think anyone's saying we have too many. First of all, uh, but I think this is a good amount, and I like the way Brian that you structured the document with 2018 actions and future and ongoing activities. As though we might not get it all done in 2018, but certainly, uh, bless you. Uh, but certainly, the things that are listed under the 2018 actions are things that we can start with, um, and not trying to highlight necessarily one thing or an or another. Um, and Marianne mentioned earlier uh, about the importance of the township and the school board being involved in the discussion uh, on affordability. Um, so I think maybe she'll say something about that later, but also that's part of what came out of the, uh, the HRC uh, uh, retreat this weekend. Um, so certainly I think the, the imp there should be some emphasis on including those other entities uh, in that, in that uh, discussion. So. I too, uh, again to echo what Lisa said about the retreat, uh, thought that we would, as we did start the discussion on goals then, that we would do a lot more of the drill down that we're starting to talk about now at the retreat. Because when you get down to the nuts and bolts, uh, I think uh, it would take longer than what we've afforded ourselves on the agenda uh, for tonight in terms of actually getting some of these things done. And I appreciate the effort that's been done to highlight um, you know, some of the resources that ought to be included in addition to those that are listed already. But again, I think this is an excellent start, and I, but I believe most of the real work in, in finalizing, if unless this is going to be a living document, but most of the work that is going to be put towards finalizing it is probably going to be uh, better in, the, in a retreat in this part two. And, and I will say, I think our, our goals have kind of been a living document, mm -hmm. um, at least over the past couple of years. I mean, I think we we get, you know, around March, uh, we tend to get like a pretty good, uh, you know, sort of snapshot of what we're thinking about, but I agree that uh, they should be refined. Um, okay, uh, well, uh, I mean, we definitely did only do a half-day retreat, and I think uh, you know that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, should we do some going through each one at this point, or do we want to hold off on that? Or I want to hold off because <laughs> I just think there's a lot of detail here, and it's either going to be a much longer conversation or or just deciding on a date seems to me appropriate for when we're going to do that other half day. Um, and this, and we want this to be able to, you want to be able to get that input from the citizens and we've already, well we've already gotten a letter <coughs> um, that talks, what, speaks specifically to goals. Um, so 
the thing is that the, we generally think of our retreats as not decision making but process, but in fact, this would be decision making and I think it should be built that way. Uh, and mm -hmm. so that's, that, I would say that. I mean, we could think about even having it as a long evening meeting, but daytime is always nicer, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, because you're fresher and everything, yeah. but that we would welcome citizens to come and be a part of that conversation, I think is the other way to do it. Is there any of our upcoming agenda, I, I know, like, don't laugh at this question, okay? But looking at new business, is there, is there enough in new business that we could move a, a major chunk of new business to have a, a bigger chunk of a regularly scheduled council meeting? Well, something that I was going to throw out, and, and your question really speaks to that in any case, is whether council wanted to consider having a work session. So mm -hmm. you, you still meet at the same time. The public is, is in fact able to be more involved than they yeah. normally would be at a work session. Um, so in fact, you open the door a little wider uh, as opposed to a retreat where it may not be as possible for folks to participate. So that's another thing to just throw out there as an option. Mm -hmm. And Brian, let me ask a question with respect to the survey, either SurveyMonkey or the um, the Google survey, whatever you had planned. What was the thought to just ask open-ended questions or to list a draft of our goals and maybe uh, <coughs> take comments on those or both? Um, I think it was more of the latter <coughs> to kind of put a draft out there, get feedback about, you know, uh, to assist us with refining them and also with prioritizing. I mean, I think, you know, we've got some pretty clear ideas about how we want to prioritize, but, um, but yeah, that was the idea. Okay. And so, arguably, these things could ha happen in tandem. Um, I mean, I, I guess, uh, you know, question is, I mean, is this totally off the mark and so we don't want to put it out there? Um, I, I mean, a again, it, there's a lot in there because I took everybody's ideas and mm -hmm. you know put them all uh, in there, um, but uh, but we could uh, if we felt comfortable we could put that out there, this out there sooner rather than later. So. What are you thinking of putting the goal or goal and action items or? Just I wasn't sure about that. That's one thing I wanted to talk about. I, I think it. I think um, so. I, you know, I ask myself. Um, that's in somewhere all the goals that are important here, I think they are. You know, not prioritized necessarily, but they're here. And are, are there any I would eliminate? No. Right. I think when you start to get into the action plan, that's when it starts to get, other than wordsmithing, a little bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. But I would think since categorically, I feel like we're in good accord about the goals in general, that sharing just the goals um, in that, in that, you know, on Facebook and things like that would be acceptable to me. I, I agree. Um, just the goals, because we don't really know exactly what the steps are, are going to be. You know, things are going to change. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to this being on or off the mark, I think it's close enough. I think we're all reasonably minded people, uh, and we um, are representative of at least the folks that we've been in communication with. Uh, and I think that's a good starting point. Uh, and then depending on how broad we get this message out, that's the opportunity for the larger community to have a say, uh, uh, comment on what we think is important, and then add additional things that perhaps we haven't missed, because we're that, that we might have missed because we're not perfect. Um, but it's at least 80%. So I think uh, just getting the goals out because again the the action items can be problematic. It's just too it would be too much I think to put out. Yeah. There was one thing that I didn't see, which was community broadband. Did that was it in there or did it intentionally it's, get? It's it's, it's part of the infrastructure. Yeah. Um, it's implied. It's in this one, right? Might want to say it more specifically in the goal. Wow. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's it's in the I guess sixth goal on the second page. So um, 
Fifth goal. Oh, is it fifth? Yeah. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Engage in continuous infrastructure oh, okay, development. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of it sort of with economic development. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. I would suggest if we put out the goals because we we've said housing is a major goal and we are hearing from our community affordability the challenges around affordability are very important that we list those first even though we haven't really established just sure I think that will communicate more clearly to the community that that's kind of we're hearing from them about affordability and we see housing as a, a key area of work this year and the rest of it can just you know be in the way that it's already listed and, uh, and you know the values I think having the values there as well I would like to see that so if there's some way to do that <laughs> I don't know how uh, just those two things you mean to list the values, list the values that list these the goals values. Say it again. It can all just be listed. Yeah. The goals are based on the yes, community. yeah. So some little, and then here's the goals. Mm -hmm. And um, we want to hear input about more specific actions, steps. Um, I don't know if you want to say we've already got this goal document that already has a fair amount of that in it. We wanna... <clears throat> so well, anyway. I think uh, at least with um, you know the, the Facebook group, we can upload this document you know so in addition to like listing these we can upload the document for people to you know be able to access it there and um i think we'll also have it on the the website as well um you know which is something we've done in the past when we've been looking for comments so yeah, i would trust that you could figure you've done this before I wanted to work with you, but I trust that you could. Yeah. Get something out. Okay. Um, so, so it sounds like we've got two things. One is to decide when we want to get together for another half day, or are we going to add this to a, a meeting and make it more of a work session? Um, so, what are thoughts about that? I know I was the one who first said that word, the R word retreat. Mm -hmm. But understanding and thinking more about the public discussion opportunity, I mm -hmm. think if it's a work session, it's better if we can make it happen. Yep. If what? Yeah, I think if we can make it happen, it's better to have it be a work session rather than a retreat. You mean have it in the evening? We'll have it be either, yeah, scheduled in a regularly scheduled council time. Or, or a Saturday. Well, for me, what's important whenever it gets scheduled is I, I do think that well I recall with that last retreat that I learned a lot about the limitations to public participation it's not recorded you know that sort of thing so given that it's the goals and we're this far along with them I think anything that we can do to optimize community awareness and participation is good but you know that that's a goal right there well, I guess I'd suggest considering having it on a, like a Saturday afternoon. And I'd, I'd suggest that because I think, it, it, at least for me, it's easier for me to think better in the morning and the afternoon as opposed to the evening. Plus, when we have an evening, we start adding other things. Mm -hmm. And I would really like, and, and people, most people are available on Saturday afternoon. Okay. Um. So, should we think about a potential staff? I'm not always available, no. <laughs> but, um, well, it's not that I never am. I mean, I think if we want people to come, it's better to have it in the evening. I do think it's better to have it at a regular time. I, I, I agree. I mean, I think it's, it, it's already on the schedule. We know exactly when it's going to be. We can talk about in advance the, the additional things that are going to be discussed or the fact that it's a work session, et cetera. Well, then uh, what about if we have it? On, uh, do we have a fifth Monday coming up? Like, no. It would be March. It would be March 26. Well, that's too far out. March 26. But I think we oh, may have two council members who wouldn't be available that evening. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, what I'll you've done in the past with work sessions is just you've, you've pushed everything else off the plate. 
and, uh -huh. and can we do that for that one of those village pass some legislation pretty quickly Which, and then gone right to the work session and that's that you could, you got two hours oh, it never happens <laughs> I mean, it would probably have to be the we start adding things we just mm -hmm. keep adding mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the 13th of March? The Tuesday. JSTF. Um, yeah. no, so Brian and I have another commitment that evening with the engineers. Thing. But I, I would forego that if that was a, a date that worked for everybody. And maybe just a system task force might be shifted a little bit to an earlier time or a different day with that advance I mean, notice. We, we could, yeah, or we could You could try. It. So does March 13th work for all of council members? Unless, oh no, we couldn't do it next week, could we? That wouldn't be enough. The 6th? I'll be, I'll be gone next week. Oh. Yeah, I can do the 13th. I can do the 13th. Okay. So, uh, Kevin? yes. So we're saying March 13th at 7? <clears throat> and, I mean, I think we should make it a two hour, seven to nine work session. Are there action items that we should consider to be best prepared for that? I mean, I think in my mind, um, you know, we would be going goal by goal, mm -hmm. um, and um, and we can definitely like reorder uh, to sort of uh, prioritize more in terms of what we're thinking. Um, but I kind of see three parts. One is making sure that the goal, which I think should be outcome oriented, really captures where we want to be. The second thing would be what actions are doable this year, because I, I felt like there was a you know a real push to think about what can we accomplish. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is, do we have the capacity to? So those are kind of tied together, but. Do we have the staff and, and you know commission and council capacity to accomplish those actions in 2018? I would suggest that we each take two of them okay. and actually yeah. uh, work it. You know, and we can talk to staff good. and we mm -hmm. can so you know rather than just nobody really taking responsibility. I agree. Yeah, and that can be a little bit more granular than with the actions by the time we get together. That sounds good. Okay. So if, if anyone has any questions about staff commitments to a particular goal, please call Patty. So yeah. shall we do that now? Yeah. Divvy them up? Yeah. I would up. be happy to take the uh, Jacoby Greenbelt and then work with uh, uh, Tecumseh and and the housing. Okay. They sort of align, I'm thinking about how they align with commission work. So for example, the yep. second one is the sustainable economic development. I would be willing to take that because that's my commission. Mm -hmm. um, and the fourth one about affordability. Um, I'm very interested. I'm probably not the only one. But I could, if somebody, I could take it. Um, I'd be glad to take it. I'll take the um, <clears throat> infrastructure one, engage in continuous infrastructure development. Um, how many, there are eight all together? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll, I'll do the justice, the justice system. Yeah, I'm not sure which other one I'm. <laughs> yeah, that's one. I'm not sure so I'll take the, I mean, I think it makes sense for me to take the transportation one. Um, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's one left, which I guess is um, the last one. I mean, I could take the last. Did you want to do the last? And I'm happy to take the, uh -huh. the anti-racism one. I'll take um, that one. You want to take that one? Okay. What does that leave me? Something I don't know anything about. Probably. <laughs> you're, you're, we're done, I think. Yeah. 
So you have the ability, you have the just village the justice, justice system, system. That's all. Oh, okay. Did we do the, so who's doing the dig? Oh, you're doing that, Brian. Yeah. Okay. Which one did you just ask, Brian? Mm -hmm. I'm just, I just have justice system. I don't know, for somebody at three or something. No. Right, so I have Marianne for Ryan. the first one, oh. uh, Lisa for oh, the wait. second one, you? me for the third one, mm -hmm. um, the fourth one is Lisa, the fifth one is Kevin, Kevin. the sixth one is Judith, Judith. seventh one is Marianne, mm -hmm. and the eighth one is Kevin. Yep. Okay. Cool. Okay. So then... Um, and then it sounds, what I heard was that we'll go ahead and put these out there on Facebook Survey Monkey. I need some help with the boxes part. So, because we said that we wanted to do those three things. So, I can handle the Facebook and the Survey Monkey thing. Um, but I guess for the boxes, it's a matter of kind of putting these on cards and asking for comments in some way. Oh, now I understand what you mean. Like what we've done before with some of the I other? Can work on that. Okay. Unless Judy wants to do it. Oh, my. You go right on the <laughs> <laughs> and, and what we've done before is, you know, we've had a box at the library and at the senior center, um, yeah, at have, Tom's. Well, yeah. I have two right now. I have okay. two boxes in my office that we can use. So we could have one here, um, one in the senior <clears> center, <throat> and then I can make a third one for the library. Okay. I'm not sure where we put a big box at Tom's. Dino's. Yeah, we did one at Dino's, Dino's. before. Um, okay. All right. Well, we'll work on Especially that. the library's good. Yeah, I mean, Tom's is a place that I'll live a lot. I think Tom's is the place that we could. That's yeah, and, the, and Tom's and the Emporium have actually been amenable to finding a spot for us before. So, so we, I mean, so we did this for the... Um, uh, the uh, police, forum. police forum, and then also for the CBE discussion, were the two times that we did that. Okay. So, are you, you and I will need to work together on exactly what content you want on cards. Yes. Because not just the goals and the values, but how you want people to respond. So. Yep. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, so then uh, I think that's a good plan for goals, and uh, we'll add the 13th to our schedules, and um, we will move into the voluntary tax collection discussion, which I think, Melissa, you're kicking off. Okay, so what, what I basically submitted into the packet was I did an updated... Um, brief on the topic and then I also kind of resubmitted information that was previously submitted um, in November of 2017. So the notion of voluntary tax collection agreements with Airbnb came up in the lodging tax discussions because what what a voluntary tax collection agreement is is that Airbnb has offered to enter into agreements with municipalities in order to collect lodging tax on their behalf and submit it to the municipality. So I did some research on this, which I'd submitted back in November, and this was actually a topic of a session at the ICMA conference that I went to. And there was also the, um, I think that, Judith had identified the the document in the Airbnb policy tool chest um, online, so I submitted that as well. So basically, Airbnb has the option for municipalities to enter into an agreement to collect the lodging taxes on our behalf. And based on the research that I've done, and I, I talked to one other operator about this. Actually, I talked to two other operators in the village about this. One of them thought it was a good idea because, well, one of them thought it was a good idea and one of them thought it was a bad idea. So from, I'm just going to go ahead and just give you the information that I collected from the ICMA conference. They strongly discouraged municipalities from entering into these agreements because I think that there are now up to 120 different 
websites that you can um, post your short-term rental on. So Airbnb is obviously one of the big players in the game because their name is synonymous with short-term rentals. So they are only one of many and most people that post or um, advertise their short-term rental will do that on a number of different platforms because there are a number of big players in the game. There are a lot of large websites that are you know, synonymous with short-term rentals that have apps. I think I probably have three or four of them on my phone myself. So Airbnb is just one of them. And from what I understand, they're the only ones that offer these voluntary tax collection agreements. So if the village were to enter into a voluntary tax collection agreement with Airbnb, they would be t collecting taxes on our behalf, but no other, no other uh, short-term rental advertising website would have the ability to do that. So then that would put, so if you're only advertising and utilizing Airbnb, it can be a good thing because you're using one website, they're collecting the tax for you, it's really easy, pretty cut and dry, they don't have to worry about the taxes. However, if you have your own website or if you're using another, another website in which to advertise and book, then it can get confusing with trying to determine, okay, which one was this week booked off of? Okay, it wasn't Airbnb, I need to get the taxes submitted to the village for that. Okay, this one was Airbnb. It can be, com it can be more complicated for the operator. So basically based on the information that was previously submitted and the information that I collected from the International City Managers Association dissuading municipalities from entering into these types of agreements, it's pretty much council's uh, decision at this point to decide if it would be something that you're willing to explore further and we actually enter into. So either we can do it or we cannot do it. So if we do it, then I would have to look into the, the steps that would need to be completed uh, through Airbnb, which I have not done yet because I wasn't sure if that would be the council or the direction the council would want to go, so I hadn't looked into it yet. I can say that there are only two municipalities in the state that, that actually have agreements with Airbnb, and that's Cuyahoga County and uh, the city of Cleveland. Those were the only ones, and because Airbnb has them all listed out on their website, and there were only two in the, in the state. So that's pretty much where I'm at with it. So it's pretty much up to council to discuss, and if, if it's something that you want me to look into further and pursue, then I can do that. I'm going to say a little bit here because, uh, you know, back when we talked about it in November, whenever it was, I kind of did a little research on it. Um, and um, I think it's something we should keep an eye on if we decide not to do it. Let me put it that way. Um, there was a study done, really, by competitors of Airbnb, which it sounded to me like the ICMA, you know, its concerns were came from that study. So, you know, those were other, that was a study, but I, I couldn't find that specific information now, but back when I looked in November, that's the way I, the way it looked to me. Um, looking to Cleveland and Cuyahoga County, you know, and just kind of keeping our eye on what's going on out there, um, I think could make sense. I mean, one of the articles I, I went back to what talks about, I mean, these are big cities. Yeah, this is LA. Um, they basically, Airbnb, Airbnb is using this as a competitive edge. Mm -hmm. They will make things easier for, well, partly because, you know, they want to, they want to curry favor with mm -hmm. municipalities. Um, and they want to make it easier for people who are renting rooms in their homes. So um, they, they think that will give them a competitive edge. Well, you know, if, the thing about it is, is they ensure that that is all getting collected. They, uh, LA, they basically said last year before LA made this deal, which was in t July 2016, you know, they could have collected $20 million for LA. So now LA is putting part of that, they're actually projecting that income as part of their budget, you know.
Can I, so, so Judith, is the main reason why you're interested in having... I just want to make sure we're getting the collection. And then, so what they did also was they were making, going to make deals with other larger organizations. You know, basically the staff went out and, and, did, and they said, uh, they asked their finance people to finalize negotiations with Airbnb and similar websites to collect that tax. So I just want to make sure we're getting the collection. Um, and I thought it would be easier for staff, you know, back when we were still talking about this lodging tax. Um, and so that's my only interest, really. Um, it's, you know, like I said, I think we should keep an eye on it if we decide not to do anything right now. And we should kind of keep an eye on what's being written about it because it's an ongoing conversation. You can find stuff in the news. And I haven't looked since, you know, we talked about it several months ago. Um, so that's all. That's my only interest, really, is to make sure we're getting the collection. Because uh, we're now we're kind of relying on, good we're just faith. on good faith that people are going to collect the tax and give it to the village. I mean, as a provider, I can say, I, I, you know, I, I most exclusively do Airbnb, but sometimes people come to me directly. It would not be a problem either way. I mean, I think we could, we should. We're, we're spending more time on this, I think, than it necessarily deserves. But the one thing it would do would be, as Judith was saying, you'd be assured that, that people who are using Airbnb and B, you're going to get those taxes. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's the main, that's the, the only value. I mean, mm -hmm. the primary value. Mm -hmm. kind of. Yeah, and that's well, that's certainly that is valuable. Um, yeah. Certainly, I mean, I mean, I don't want to cast aspersions on folks who have temporary rentals. I, I guess the expectation would be that you want to pay, you ought to pay your taxes, you know, period. But uh, if we didn't have the IRS, <laughs> would all of us pay all of our taxes? <laughs> so, I mean, it's you know, I see it as a convenience, and I suppose. Um, I mean, I can certainly imagine that some of these lesser known uh, websites are going to eventually go that way, um, either being pressured by Airbnb or, or by the municipalities uh, to, to make it more of a convenience. Uh, but, um, it, but one could surmise that this might be the only guarantee um, that you could have the expectation that you would always get the appropriate taxes. Um, and again, not casting aspersions at anyone, you know, but you have a system or you don't. Right. Well, I mean, I do think arguably this could also make it easier for the, you know, lodging provider. I mean, you know, so, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how you do your, deal yeah. Do, do we know, and, I, and I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I'm saying it's not that big, I don't think it's a big, big deal. People. Maybe they, you know, have self, they, they might get some reservations off the Stay Yellow Springs, Airbnb, B, BRBO, and TripAdvisor. Those are probably the main ones. But anyway, I mean, if they have a business, then they're, they, they know where they're getting those reservations. I mean, they already are having to keep those things separate. And if it's better for the village, I mean, that's, the, I mean, that's what we need to look at. Is it better for the village? to have Airbnb collect the taxes. So but with Airbnb, Marianne, like, won't you have to add Yes, it what, I, what I did is I ha added the tax into my charge. And I had to actually over add because they don't do cents. <laughs> so then at the end of the year or half a year, however we're supposed to, then I'm going to have to back it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with a formula mm -hmm. that I know how to do. Okay. <laughs> and I'm sure Melissa does, and she yeah. probably will provide us with that right. formula. But I agree with you. I've always thought you should know what revenue streams are coming yeah. from where. I mean, they give you a report, right? I mean, yeah. So. Yeah, and I have a calendar. And I, right. okay. I can say that with the, the uh, permitting process, we were able to, Denise and I and um, her intern, we were able to identify all of the short-term rentals within the village, and I believe that we've received permits from all of them. Um, what we did was we'd sent out, we collected them. It, the deadline was actually January 31st, and about mid-January, we really started to dive into 
okay, where are they all at, you know, checking on different days and such, and we were able to identify all of them because it's, it's a little tricky because they don't give you addresses, and some of the pictures of the properties might not necessarily be a street view. So um, it was a little tricky trying to figure out which ones were which, but once that was figured out, letters were sent out to the ones that had not submitted permits, and we got responses from all of them because we extended the deadline till middle of February. We gave them an extra month from the time that we sent out the letters. So we were able to identify all of them. So I can say that there are only, it's either 20 or 25, I can't remember um, it, the exact number, but it's a, it's a pretty small number. So I feel like that's manageable. Um, it's at least within my purview to be able to keep a pretty good eye on, I would think. If we had a thousand of them, I might say, well, we might need to look at this. So I think it's manageable at this point, but I agree with Judith. I think that, you know, and Kevin, as he said, more and more of these websites might start coming on with this. And if it becomes the norm and it's across the board with all of the, you know, all of the websites, then it might, it might make sense to do it at that point. So you raise an interesting point that, that, I imagined uh, I, that I plan to bring up years in the future. How many is too many uh, short-term rentals uh, for a village like Yellow Springs? That's right now. Let's leave it as a rhetorical question, but I expect that we'll have to address that at some point. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it sounds like at this point we will wait and see. Is that? Well, keep track of it and look at. I, I, I mean, mean, if staff starts to feel like there's a problem with the collection, that would be another reason to look right. at it. But you know, it's still just starting. So. Can we, in the meantime, Melissa, if you don't mind, just go ahead and, if it's not burdensome, to just find out what the process is mm -hmm. for yeah. getting it going with uh, Airbnb? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I mean, one question is, do they do it for a municipality this small? I mean, I don't know. It seems like they're it's available to. Request, but that might not be the case. Okay. I can do that and put it in a future um, report of mine in council packet. All right, great. Thanks. Okay. Great. All right, well, let's move on to uh, housing. Okay. Marian? Um, so I submitted late um, a document, one page document, so everyone should have a hard copy of it. It's called, it's dated today, 2018. I also emailed it today to the mm -hmm. email. So um, we're sort of still wrapping our heads around how we move housing planning and the discussion of housing planning forward. And so we have our group meeting, our housing advisory board, and I submitted a report on what the housing advisory board is doing. So I, I'll continue to do that just sort of like commission. But then there will be issues that will be coming to council that will be separate, or may be separate. So um, tonight, what I'd like council to uh, look at are these two draft questions that uh, would potentially be the questions that we would be asking at the community conversations. Um, we're in the process of developing the data, the information that people will be given, and we don't have that together yet. Mm -hmm. But these are the questions as they stand right now. Um, so I'll read the questions and then I would just like to have comments. So the first question is, how would you like to see the village government address the housing issues and trends highlighted in the housing needs assessment and why? And the second question, the village owns the glass farm located on the northwestern side of the village off of King Street. It contains over 25 acres. The village has slated for housing development. What kind of housing do you think should be developed on the glass farm and why? So um, I guess we need to look at what does council want the citizens to be thinking about what kind of information are we wanting to get back from citizens and do these questions mm -hmm. hit that so can i uh, add, can I yeah, add a little something to this because uh patty and kevin uh magruder and i met you know we're looking at the powerpoint that bowen did mm -hmm. so it's talking about this same 
uh, presentation, you know, we're trying to hone it down to really looking at Yellow Springs and the demographics of Yellow, Yellow Springs is primarily what we thought. But in terms of another point of input, Patty suggested, and, I, and we all agreed it was a good idea, we went to the last bit by Bowen, mine's all scribbled up here, where he talks about priorities and strategies. And we thought about, there was about, how many was there to start with? 17. 17, and we, and we broke it down to about 10. And we thought it's one of those things where people could use the little sticky notes mm -hmm. um, and like, you know, say these are where we think the priority should be. And it's, it's just another way really of getting at the same information, I think, mm -hmm. but it kind of, it doesn't require conversation. People afterwards could go up and stick mm -hmm. their little sticky. So we're, we're kind of working on that angle mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyway. That so, sounds good. Yeah. So my main question was, um, I guess, why the decision was to focus in on the glass farm. So presumably, I guess you guys talked about that. Um, I think because um, people know that we're going to be looking at the glass farm. It's it's out, and, and also to let people know that we are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have? Do you, um, say, do you want to say more about that? Well, yeah. I mean, I guess when it, when I looked at the two questions, I kind of imagined collapsing these two into a question, and maybe or maybe not focusing on Glass Farm. Um, and then I still think about this broader question about where do we want the village to be? Yeah. Because, you know, what these questions to me are about are about tactics and policy, um, which I think is important. I mean, I want us to capture that. Um, <coughs> but I, I guess I wonder, you know, I mean, there are potentially different ways that we might go about delivering on the housing. <coughs> you know, I, I mean, maybe we start at the glass farm or maybe we start you know, with infill or something, I don't know. So so that was my, my main thought. Well, do you have a suggested question, overarching? Um, so, I mean, so maybe it would be a question something like, uh, you know, where, where, do, where do you want the village to be, um, you know, in the next 10, 20 years, and I guess that's somewhere getting at just sort of what we're expecting in terms of population and, you know, schools and, and all the different things around that, and then something about how we, how the village should go about doing that in terms of policy. So a vision, mm -hmm. sort of what's your vision of, how, how do, I mean, that's what I'm thinking, but how do we hone in, if we could talk about a vision for the village, how do we hone in on how it impacts housing? Well, in the report, I mean, there were probably too many things to consider, but uh, in terms of the trends, um, so I wondered if that question about where we want to end up, if that question could be prefaced by a discussion of the trends that have been identified. Yeah. We are going this way now. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to mm -hmm. end where it looks like we're going to end up, or do you want to do something to divert it one direction or another? So, like, we know the village is getting older, whiter, mm -hmm. uh, richer, with a substantial portion of poorer, or losing middle income, mm -hmm. or losing families. Is this how you want? Do you, do you, you want this? Do you, do you support these trends? You want to? Shift these is that what I mean, that is the that is the central point uh, of folks that I think we need to get to, mm -hmm. um, because it might be okay for some people. I mean, it's as as I mean, I can't even say that with a straight face, but but it might be okay that somebody is perfectly happy with the way things are going. Um, so so we can be presumptuous and say, well, no, I don't think we do, and we ought to try to swing the pendulum back the other way um, by changing the trend, and these are the kinds of things that 
or, or what are the kinds of things you can do or maybe we suggest the kinds of things that, that can be done to, to change the trends? I was going to say um, in the work we did on the PowerPoint, we were looking at current demographics, the trend of where we're going, that was, we wanted to present that. And actually, I guess I hadn't read your, this uh, very, well, I guess this, we got this today. Anyway, I didn't put it together because we were assuming that we would be doing just that. What would you like to, the village to be? Relative, you know, these are the, this is the way we're going. Is that what we want? Mm -hmm. And if not, what is it that we want? So I think that was the assumption. Somehow, this got a little di uh, was worded a little different, but you put it together for us. But um, so I think that was our assumption. Am I not right, Patty? Uh, that's what I can. Yeah. yeah. And that's so. And we were going to put those trends, you know, as described in the Bowen report, mm -hmm. together, and you know, and kind of end up there. Uh, with the discussion and then have those places where people can then do their sticky right. thing at the end. Yeah. Kind of a, like here's where we are now, this is what we're projected this to be if we don't do anything. Do you want to change this and then how would you like to go about, what do you think would be the effective tools out of these ten things that we're going to put up here on the board? Right. Yeah. So, so maybe a question, so we present the data, the trends, and then say the question something like, this is the way we're going, is this what you want to be happening? Is this where you want the village to go? Have a discussion and then do what you were suggesting of lifting possible strategies to, to mitigate the trend and have people do the dot Forced choice, but what I multi-voting. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the the only downside I think to asking the question that way is it becomes a yes/no question. You don't want to ever ask yes/no questions, and even when, the way Kevin said, like I can't even answer that with a straight face, which might silence people who have different perspectives. In when I've developed facilitator guides with very open-ended questions, I've always uh, kind of when preparing pretended like what would the multiple choice question be underneath that so like as an example um what what do you see as the you know vision of the future for yellow springs one implied option is you know a highly affluent community primarily you know affluent professionals or something then another choice would be you know racially mixed you, know, you kind of come up with a continuum of of uh of answers or like this first one, how would you like to see village government address the housing issues? You know, choice one, get out, don't be involved at all. <laughs> Number two, you know, help be supportive and make certain things happen. You know, what are the, what are the possible range of answers underneath the open-ended questions? I guess is what I, and I, I don't have that answer, but um, that way if for the person who's up there in front of the room facilitating, they're not opening themselves up to so much polarization where people are like the yes portion, the portion and the no portion and the answers are kind of in between in the, in the gray zone in between. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right on, Lisa. Um, yeah, because the, the answers are going <laughs> to, will be nuanced beyond, away from yes, no, or up and down. Um, you know, but you just, uh, having said that, you just really can't separate um, any responses well, from the possibility of, of doing some of these Maybe it things. could be something like, this, this is the way we're going, what about these trends do you like? <laughs> what <laughs> things would you want to, are there things? Change. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a good idea. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think that's good. It, to the second question, I don't know who all participated in the charrette that the Antioch College had about the Antioch Village. But one of the things that I found really helpful is that they had some different options for people to react to um, because I think people come to this topic with passion but they maybe haven't thought through like when you say what, what, would, what should happen with the 25 acres, well, yee, that's a lot to think about. So I mean, I don't know if there's if there's some options 
you know, three having to do with the percentage of affordable housing or having to do with some some mix of, you know. Maybe the glass farm should be one of those bullet points. Start one of the I, strategies. Mm -hmm. And I think it is. I, yeah, maybe. I was going to say. Yeah, I, the glass farm is in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wondered if, since you do this kind of thing, if you could send our group, you know, when you're, maybe if you have any thoughts, you know, about this idea of multiple choice. Different, you know, just if, if you. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would think Kevin Magruder probably has a lot of experience too. But I think the more, depending on how many people participate, um, the more the session could people could be broken down into small groups for like interactive multi-voting activities rather than just speak out discussion. Okay. Um, so it's like if everybody had a common a common presentation and then broke into groups of five to seven people with a facilitator for each group. You know, th these are some things, some techniques to um, and we maximize have, participation. And we have done that before with uh, when we have had a larger group where we've, you know, had several mediators who were able to, mm -hmm. you know, capture that on the, on the, um, you know, Flow pad or whatever. So, mm -hmm. but yes, if it's helpful, yeah. I'll send some yes. more ideas. Yeah, if it's you helpful, like that idea of a small group facility. Yeah. That's how I'll send it to Judy. Well, yeah. Send why don't you send it to me? Just to keep yeah. it clean because we have yeah. two council. Oh, members. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. When are you meeting again? Monday. Okay. I'll get it to you. Yep. Thank you. Can Can you come up? Becky Campbell, and since the council is here tonight, I'd like to address a question. Probably about 10 years ago, I meant to look up the date, uh, there was a referendum passed in Yellow Springs by the population that the glass farm was not to be developed into housing. What has happened to that? How long is a referendum good? And uh, it, nobody seems to be looking at that. Is it just I think I can address that, Becky. Um, that uh, referendum was on a particular portion of the glass farm, uh -huh. which is now under conservation easement. And that's where the wetlands and the prairie is. So it won't be developed into housing. And the referendum was about donating the land to Home Inc. for an affordable housing project. So the land is off the table, and this is not a Home Inc. project. But you population also voted down developing the no, land. No, that was, it was it about a that particular. specific, uh, by not using that land for the development. For, uh, on that, yeah. those particular, the particular part of the glass farm, yeah. Okay. So it wasn't all of the, it all was, of the acreage, it was part of the acreage. It, it was about, the, it was the a referendum was project. about not yeah. donating land for a home inc affordable housing project on part of the glass farm. The way I understood it was it was about a, that particular proposal that had been developed, yeah. correct? Yeah. yeah. It wasn't, at, you know, forever. It, it was not was. about never, ever developing housing on the glass yeah. No, it was a response to, yeah. Brian, I sent yeah. you, I sent, uh, you, everyone sent you goals, and I, I wrote this somewhere, but um, I think what I, said in the goals was about, with respect to affordable housing, that we don't move forward without considering um, the Antioch College Village, you know, what, what they're doing sure. or what they're planning to do. So I don't know if anyone representing Antioch College Village is on the committee or... Well, Kevin Magruder uh, mm -hmm. works at Antioch. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, I mean, one of the strategies that I think think that we need to be doing is being in active communication with any potential developer or someone who owns land that's going to be developed and uh, Lisa you are going to be talking with someone mm -hmm. yeah we have yeah to, to set that up yeah. Yeah. Okay. We, we are and we're working on that okay yep okay so anything else about housing for now 
Um, we're having a conversation with a resource person uh, tomorrow about inclusionary zoning, and I anticipate we'll have some information about that at our next um, council meeting. Okay. Oh, no, there is a second thing. Um, so Judith and I met yesterday to start looking how we want to start moving this forward. And we would like council to approve getting second opinions to review the and maybe do a more in-depth geotechnical study of the glass farm. In other words, the soil structure in the glass farm and um, the infrastructure design plan that Ken LeBlanc did. And I think we would, I am not even sure how we would go about that, but I'm hoping that Patty would have. Well, um, before I answer that question, let me this say as I told Judith today it's my understanding that there was a geotechnical report done on the glass farm some years ago and unfortunately Judith I wasn't able to get with Denise today and check on that one so we may already have two geotechnical reports the one that was done several years ago and the one that we did just a couple of years ago but um, as far as how you would have to proceed I mean we would have to decide exactly what we want and then we're gonna have to put out uh, depending on how much it could potentially cost, either an RFP or get three price quotes, which is how we normally do that. Um, so it, it would take a little bit of time, but can it be done? Yes. I just need to know exactly what information you want to get from this report. Maybe if we could get that second report, um, mm -hmm. you know, before our little committee meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and so we could look at it together. I, I can try to get with Denise tomorrow and uh, we just and see. We just want to be sure what is what is feasible, what is possible, and the glass that we that you know we don't want to start going down a path of thinking about you know the glass farm and not have totally accurate information about what's possible there. I, I think the report that I'm aware of was done when um, the um, retention detention area was being considered. Mm -hmm. And it was done to decide how much, how big of an area would have to be, you know, you know the soil structure on the eastern mm -hmm. part of the glass farm. Uh, but only on the eastern part, I is think your understanding. I think, I mean, I think I, have, I might have even given, I'll look at the documents I have. Okay, I, I still have, I think I actually gave the doc, your documents, did I give them back to you or did I give them to Denise? One, I gave them. I, I don't know. I'll look. Well, I, we'll, I we'll look around the office tomorrow and see what we can find and then, um, and then maybe, you know, by, if we have that by Monday and then, if, again, if the parameters are decided as to what you want, it's simple enough to figure out how to get to the end point. I just need to know what those want. You know, I'm thinking since Becky asked the question, it would be useful to look at that old referendum so that we're totally clear about okay. what happened there. But all, I mean, a referendum is on that particular issue at that particular time. It's yeah, but I just think CD. it's good to have that in front I'm of us so we have it. Yeah. That's my thought. Um, just then we could idea. also <laughs> pull out from the yeah, like plan yeah. where I think it mentions housing on the glass one. I'm pretty sure it can. Okay, so we'll put that in the packet for next time? Yeah, just so we're totally clear okay. on all that. Okay, I think that's a good idea. All right. So, uh, Melissa, utility roundup. Okay. So this is going to be a fairly easy discussion. Um, so I looked into a process in terms of implementation of a utility roundup program <laughs> if that is the direction in which we wish to go, which I believe it is. So um, I... I was, I had a really hard time trying to get this answer in terms of what would need to happen because I reached out to our auditor. Our auditor said, um, you know, we, we audited a number of municipalities. We don't know anybody else that does this. Um, I could see how there could be issues. So it's like, well, there, there might be, but how do we do this if we want to do it? So I finally ended up, after a number of phone calls and getting transferred and voicemails and transferred to somebody else and shuffled around um, the Auditor of State's Local Government Services, I finally got an email back from somebody that gave us a very clear um, set of tasks in which we could complete 
to be able to implement a program such as this. So I have that in the uh, brief that I put into the packet. So the first step would be that we would need to get an opinion, a legal opinion from our solicitor on the legal authority for the village to have the program. So once that would be completed, if the legal opinion is fa favorable towards the program, then we could have a resolution by council, which would be just like what we did tonight um, in, the, in, in approving the creation of two new funds. And so council would approve the creation of the fund. So then the legal opinion, the approved resolution by council, the in the description of the fund would have to be submitted to the state auditor's office, uh, local government services section for approval. I did not get a timeline um, as to how long it might take to receive that approval, but I can definitely get that time frame so that council is aware of that. Um, I figured we'd just kind of take this one step at a time as, as we move through this and try to get maybe a, a target at the end of this once we have all of these things answered. And then if approved, we would have to have policies, procedures, and guidelines that would need to be developed. And all of the, the research and talking to folks and just kind of looking at this over time, it, it, it seems that the best approach to this, if all of this is favorable in, in this direction, that the village doesn't actually manage the program, that it would be managed by, I would assume, a, a 501c3 type organization that would be, you know, the council, council would approve the policies and procedures and guidelines and such, and then we would have an organization outside of the village that would actually be handling that, um, the, you know, the, the approval process and things like that and the awarding, the awarding and the, and the um, kind of the end result of this whole thing. So basically, if council's a, you know, supportive of this, I'm supportive of it, we can move forward through these steps. I can get the, the time frame answered uh, for the approval through the state auditor's office. The only one thing that I would like to ask council to consider would be that our new utility billing software conversion is supposed to happen next week. And once we are converted, you know, we do billing one time a month and with new software just comes all new processes and we've been paralleling for a month now. But I just want to make sure that my staff is comfortable in just doing the regular things that they need to do within that software before we would make a change. And so I would like to ask that if, if we move through with all of this, and I know that Chris has some opinion as to time frames for his end, um, his end of the steps, but I would like to ask that maybe we set a target date for implementation and, and getting all of this off the ground and actually working for January 1st of 2019. I'm willing to negotiate that obviously, but I just wanna make sure that our utility billing staff are comfortable in using the new software before we make any kind of changes because I don't know what types of changes, I know that our, our software can handle it, but I don't know what that would actually look like within the software because we're just now getting to that point. So that's where I'm at with that. So um, Chris, did you want I'd like to say something. So I started working on this over a year ago, I mm -hmm. guess, and um, stopped because you were gonna change the software and it just, that took longer than what you thought. But I've talked to two communities in Ohio that do it and yes, they, they take the money and they give the money to a nonprofit. In one case, it's a, the, their community foundation, and I don't remember. The other is sort of like a community action agency or something. Um, they're, both situations are different. One community automatically rounds the utility bills up to the nearest dollar, and people can opt out. The other people have to opt in. At any rate, yeah, there aren't many places in Ohio that do it, but there are places around the country that do it. I think we need to start working on this. And while I hear, I hear you, Melissa, so what I, I guess would suggest is, first of all, it is doable. I mean, if we wanna do it, it's doable. We'll find a way to do it. And I think we could be working on, <coughs> at the village level, how we wanted to have it set up. We could be getting whatever uh, 501c3 or 
the, the community foundation, the credit union, who, whatever nonprofits that we need, you know, get the process set up so that you know, so that then we could have everything in place. You know what would be great is to get more uh, direct inform you know, about those two programs that you're aware of. You know, I would love to see that. I mean, I think that would be helpful okay, to can, all of us because we, we might want to just use one of them as a, as our guide. And what? How, I mean, I could like write a little report for the next council meeting, or what would be helpful? That would be great. Yeah. Sure. Okay. And I, and any, Lori, you know, and I have all of those communications in here as well. So I have those <laughs> municipality names oh. in here. From Napoleon was one of them. Uh -huh. They were both up for defiance, or even just place. seeing some of their materials and yeah, if they so have a program description I mean, or maybe something. Maybe you don't need to write up anything. Maybe we just gather a little bit of theirs. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've even got the forms from Napoleon. That's the only one that. I mean, I I um, I think this list of steps is an excellent start. I think it's a category of steps that I would recommend and you know I mean and certainly when you think of a project like this you know there's analysis planning program design legal input resolutions approvals policies and procedures and that that won't happen overnight mm -hmm. um, but uh, we should ad advance as quickly as possible a software implementation should never take precedence over the experience of the people in our community ever and I don't support, I think we should begin action on this immediately and move as quickly as we can. I do not support putting this off. And, and I, I mean, I, it's a call to action for my fellow council members to get moving on this immediately. Well, I would like to suggest in that case, um, putting together a, a plan, um, I mean, who's doing what? kind of thing yeah and maybe bring something back to the next meeting that's more specific yeah I mean I, I, I can outline some ideas quickly this evening or you know how about you and I work on this I would be delighted okay you know because I mean this is kind of overlapping a little bit over into the, the new business mm -hmm. piece um, but I think that there's a financial analysis that has to happen before we even are convinced that the roundup will do what well, we, we needed to do. Some of, I mean, yeah. We so briefly figured out how much probably we would make. Yeah. What's yeah, what is the need in the village? What are the kind of the clip levels? What's the range of needs? How much revenue is needed to make a difference? And how much money would be generated by the roundup? And is it enough? And then decide how a program would be administered. Um, I, I guess I also, Chris, have you looked into this at all? Uh, no, I just found out about it. A request I had last week was that I had a preliminary discussion. And my assumption is, is that I'm not sure how we would do funding, but I don't I don't think there's going to be an issue around it. I'm sure if we want to do it, the question would be if there's two other communities and the auditor wasn't aware of it, do we really need to get a legal opinion? I mean, if the state's involved, then it, we, that's a timeline that we can't control. Um, but I, I would think that it's doable. I can't think of any reason why we wouldn't. So it's a, it's a, and part of the research I thought would be useful is looking at like DPNL for I mean we've got our uh, you know there are a couple of programs that community members can already uh, I mean just knowing where, what other resources are ready and then um, my understanding is like you know the like DPNL for example they've got their own programs and you know how how that all works. I mean, we could maybe look at that as well in terms of uh, you know as a guide. How, how they vet the recipients? Well, because people don't um, give extra money to DPNL, do they? No, they've got but they've got program, and I don't. I yeah, can't. I, I looked into it a long time ago. What? what is it? Are you talking about Heap? No, they've got their own program. They, I'm they, pretty sure. Yeah, and do, Ellis and, and and you know it's like. Uh, you know, up to a certain point, they're able to assist people with very low income, and I, where that I think it's they prop maybe it's a write-off for them. I'm not sure. And I looked at it a long time ago, but I don't remember. But uh, you know, Ellis was involved in some of this utility uh, in terms of um, you know these kind of programs. Ellis actually had worked in this area, so he's a re potential resource. So, or you maybe already know. So Marianne, I heard I heard you suggest that you and I might. Yeah work on this? Is yeah. that something everyone's 
I, I would love awesome. to do that. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I mean, being new, I guess I don't know all of what has been done. Um, and I read probably some of the same things you did, Marianne, about, uh, yeah, some communities up in northern Ohio and, you know, they, they have a nonprofit and folks can opt in or opt out. And I guess I would wonder, had, have we done enough thinking about that, about how we would present it? Um, to oh, that's part of the what village. We need to do. So right. that's yeah. I mean, I think uh, you know this report from Melissa was you know an action step to mm -hmm. move this forward. Mm -hmm. And I think you know council has said that we all want this to happen. So right. And 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 I don't hear the January 1, 2019 date as being a delay. It's if I'm hearing Melissa right. It's just let's let's start there and and bring back because she says she's able, open to negotiation it's just that that's a stick in the ground to say by then we could be ready to do it and if sooner great but i don't think we're saying do nothing to that by any there's means. a lot of groundwork that has mm -hmm. to be done yeah. Yeah. and i don't know what the time frames with the state would <laughs> even be i mean if they've got it, it could be something. weeks. It could be months. I, I don't. Yeah. I don't know that. Yeah. Yet. Why, why does the state have to be involved? Well, the, the, because they're unaware of any programs like this, and they indicated that they would want to review a legal opinion and what we how we intend to do it. Well, and the state has to approve creation of funds. Okay, the the village municipalities have a. The ability to create funds such as what we did, there are very specific parameters in which we can create our own funds without approval. So this would be outside of those parameters. So they would have to uh, actually give approval for this because it doesn't fall under the umbrella of funds that you know are very common that you know we have a new grant that has to have money isolated. That's very common. The state doesn't want to have to handle those things constantly. They used to require the approval of all funds. And that became very tedious for them because, again, with grants, they have to That's isolate money and they would have to approve those. So they have this umbrella in which, you know, municipalities are able to not submit for approval, but this would be outside of that. So, And maybe if we draw their attention to the fact that, in fact, there are a couple of programs mm -hmm. that could help. Mm -hmm. That we modeled after, then yeah. that could help. So regarding that date, I just want to clarify that what I think is needed is a clear action plan with people responsible and dates. And my pushback on the way it's articulated in this action plan is not to say it might not take that long, but the reasoning had to do with the implementation of a software. And I do not think that that's a justified reason in and of itself to put off implementation of a program if we can get it done sooner. It's early in the year. I think we need to move forward as quickly as we can. You might want to articulate why you feel that great sense of urgency. Uh, okay. I mean, I'm just saying. That well, I mean, I think that the... Um, My impression is that you are yeah, hearing I mean, from we're, people we're who are hearing this from our, our, our community. We have uh, um, uh, people that are getting, you know, asking other people to put their names on sort of petition-like things to express their concern about the affordability of utilities. Um, I come to this from sort of a guiding principle that nobody should have to move away from Yellow Springs because they can't afford the utilities. And that isn't the case right now. I come to it from a guiding principle of saying, you know, people who can't pay their utilities should not be at risk of having their utilities shut off by the village in the winter. I don't think that's consistent with our values. And so in order to get to that, I mean, I don't even know if everybody shares those values, but those are the ones I've been thinking about as I talk to people in the community. And so for me, coming at it from a, you know, I have these two sides of myself, this heart side and then this finance side. So I think, okay, if this is what we want to have happen, then what's the financial analysis and then what's the project plan? that has to happen to make it work and can we connect those dots? So really that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, I think this is just a real practical implementation of what we've all been saying. We're all about affordability, but I think the way um, Lisa articulated that was like, well, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is, this is what folks are living through uh, and not just this cloudy, 
you know, thing called affordability or lack thereof. You know, it's really uh, hitting real people uh, where they live. And um, I think we're in agreement in that respect you know, that we do want to move forward. Um, so I think what we're talking about now and the team of you all stepping, fo stepping up, I think, is a good idea. Yep. Okay, well, let's move into uh, the affordability and uh, utilities under new business because um, I think we've already been talking about that. Yeah, I mean, I feel like actually I've said what I have had, to, what I said, wanted to say. Right. I wanted to express those values. I wanted to express a call to action. I feel like we have one. I think it aligns with the goals work. Um, so I actually don't have anything uh, to add at this point then. Yep. I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. Add it. Um, we have these three main governing bodies in Yellow Springs. We have the township that governs the township and in which Yellow Springs is located. We have the village government and we have the school board and the, and the school district also goes outside of the village. Um, for a couple years, I have been wanting to meet with the school board, and for whatever reason, it didn't happen. There has been some communication, well, like we met with the township maybe two years ago or something. Right. At any rate, it, it's understandable. We're all focused on what our focus is. But we have not been talking to each other. And sometimes that doesn't make any difference. And when things are flush with when every uh, Pocket, when the uh, whatever you, coffers the coffers are full of money. Hey, you know, we'll build a fire station, build new schools, raise our utility rates. What's the deal? But when we start, when the rubber hits the road in terms of money, then I think we need to change the way we operate. And I think if if two years ago, if the township, the schools, and the village government had gotten together and said, hey, this is what we're looking at. You know, our fire, the fire station is bad. Hey, we have utility issues in the village. Hey, this, we need to do something about the schools. If, now, it, the, you know, we still would have had to spend money on all those things, but at least we could have sort of done some collaboration and understanding that, okay, well, maybe we'll have to cut back a little here so you can do that. But how it's played out is the village, we raised our utilities, we got in there first. The fire, the township got in there next with the uh, levy for the fire station and the schools have come along last with this levy. And I think there's a lot of resistance to the levy, and apparently there are also now people that are upset about the fire station, and we know there are people that are upset about the utilities. So um, I'm not sure that there's anything we can do about that now, but at least at the village level, I do think we need to relook at our utility plan, and especially the electric, and, and I don't, I mean, I don't want to get us in the red, but if there's anything we can do, for, I'll give an example that Don Hollister mentioned to me. He said that it used to be that the electric, that the first amount of electric was at a discounted rate, and it was called a lifeline or something. The idea was that if you really don't have any money, and if you really save, you know, you're not running all your stuff and everything. You have enough money to, like, run your refrigerator and whatever. And I don't know if we want, would want to look at that, but that, that's just one idea. And that, I'm not sure when that happened. I'm, but but um, I, I just think it's very serious. I think the issue of affordability is very serious, and, um, and it's complex. Um, and to the degree we can do something about it, to the good degree we can start talking with the school board and the township if there's wants any ways that we can coordinate and collaborate, I think it's worth looking into. And, and then I think going out, I think we should, we should find a way to integrate big project decision making so that we know what the the other group is doing because we're, we are all together, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know 
<coughs> yeah. Well. I'll just say, I, I guess I was just reflecting on when I lived in Massachusetts, schools were, you know, there was, really everything was under, uh, the, it was all very coordinated. And you didn't have a township because the, the uh, you know, like Amherst, the, the line goes from Amherst to Belchertown to, you know, the, the surrounding countryside is part of the town. I mean, it's not so it's, so you're not, you don't have these different entities that are fighting over the, you know, limited resources that people have. And so I think it's more of an issue because of the way our government is organized. You know, mm -hmm. Everything's separated out. You know. <clears throat> little side comment. What yes, I well, I, I totally agree that we need to coordinate our efforts. Um, I, I do want to, you know, be mindful of the fact that we did go through a utility study that, you know, guided some of these decisions because utility rates were not raised for, you know, 20, 30 years, and and that's frustrating too. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't respond to it. So, um, all right. Well, we need to continue this discussion, um, but I guess we should. Uh, quickly go through our reports and then uh, wrap our meeting up. So, Patty? Um, well, you have my report. <coughs> just uh, two quick things I'd like to bring your attention to. One is the draft expenditure sheet for the boards and commissions that um, um, I brought up at the last meeting. Was after, I was asked to bring a, a possible draft that is in there for your review if um, anybody has any comments that they'd like to send back to me. Um, but this will keep us on the straight and narrow with the auditor and make sure that we have the requisitions and the purchase orders entered in a timely manner to make the expenditure. So, Patty, the, uh, you know, at first I thought this was about budgets, but it's not. It's about actual expenditures. Mm -hmm. and, and so for HRC, if HRC uh, gives a grant, should this be filled out? Or this, this well, you have a form for that. Yes. And, and and so those usually work out okay. This is for unusual things. Um, uh, for and and I'm not I'm not saying that these expenditures that I'm going to mention were right or wrong. I'm just pulling them out of my head as recent expenditures. Um, there was one for the Arts and Culture Commission to get the new hanging uh, things for the gallery, and we needed to take care of that. There was one. Um, uh, for um, HRC, or not HRC, Environmental Commission for the rental of AUM. Uh -huh. Those are unusual things that don't happen every day. Things like the HRC grants and the block parties that we already have a procedure for, and it, those things I feel can go along as normal. This, this is for the unusual things that crop up. Um, because the, the boards and commissions are going to start expending more money in different places and we need to make sure that we track these things appropriately, get them entered in a timely manner, get the uh, purchase orders approved before the expenditure is made. Um, I mean, and I, I, have a, I have a full procedure for my staff. We don't, nobody buys anything without getting three quotes. I mean, and, and, and we don't care what it is. So um, this is just, this is a much abbreviated <coughs> of what they have to go through. So you'll, will you provide email, electronic copies of this for us? Or are you asking our? Well, uh, uh, right now it's a draft. So <coughs> unless someone has an issue with it, I can take the draft watermark off and send it out. If that's, if, if everyone's okay with it. Okay, yeah, and Melissa, Melissa has looked at it and made her suggestions. I've incorporated all those, so. Um, we should be good to go. The other thing that I wanted to uh, mention is there, you'll see there's a request for uh, council to approve Christmas Eve as a holiday. Here's the thing about Christmas Eve. We have like three people plus the PD in the building <laughs> and nobody comes in all day. Um, it's a day that people travel. Um, right now we have nine holidays um, and this would add a tenth holiday and it would go, I mean, it, it's just, it, it's kind of a useless day to have people sitting here anyway. Nobody comes in. I, in, the, in the three Christmases that I've been here, nobody has come in on Christmas Eve day. So if council is in agreement with that, we, 
I'll get with Judy and we'll figure out what the process is to add that to, to, the, to the slate. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. um, I support it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. That's that, everything else. If you don't have any questions, I'm good. Thank you for being judges. <laughs> yes. Said judges, not guinea pigs. That was fun. All right, Melissa. Okay, um, I just went over a lot of the things that I have going on. Um, the only thing that I'll hit on is the pool. So I think that based on the last council meeting, there there was a discussion about not increasing rates but I, or raising the fees, but I do think that we still need to have a change in the ordinance that includes an adult plus one child membership. Mm -hmm. So I do think that that needs to be brought before council. And we haven't done that already? No, we, okay. don't, we don't currently have that. So okay. even without making any other changes, I still think that we should make that one because that's, a, that's an annual request from folks. Well, and the other thing we should do is uh, what I think was mentioned about figuring out what the costs yes. are, For you know, so that we yeah, so that yes. we understand that. Um, we were once the weather got warmer. What we were going to do was have a walkthrough up there to identify all of the um, areas that would need to be fixed, and then there's also going to be a walkthrough from a actual pool operations company that comes out and looks at the mechanics and everything in the pool too. So that, that's, that's been on the agenda. We were just kind of waiting for a, a better okay. day, but clearly this week would have been decent for it. Well, if adult plus one can be ready for March 5th, let's okay. bring it then. If not, the uh, 19th. I can do that. I already had ordinance written, so. Okay. Can, I, can I throw something in there? Would council consider having Melissa bring an increase in rates for non-village residents? I, we should look. I feel like we should look at the rates and look. And I was thinking that too. Maybe we should consider that. I, I don't know what they are, and it would be good for us all to know what the rates are. Right. Yeah. Uh, so maybe when you're bringing the adult plus one, bring current all bring current the, rates. Bring all the current okay. rates, so we mm -hmm. know what they are, and we can. Right. So I, I guess my, my question is then: Do you want the legislation at March fifth, or you just want to see the fees and have the legislation at March ninth? I think we're ready for adult plus one, okay. um, yeah. but we I do not foresee that we'll have be ready to have a full discussion about the the pool fees mm -hmm. until we get more until information. Until we have the maintenance yes. information. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll so. at least bring the fees. Right. And then we'll have that. Okay, I can do that. And then one thing that wasn't in my report <coughs> that got finalized today which I could have went through the roof over this I have been working on the Army Corps of Engineers grant since I started this grant has been in existence since 2007 and I finally went over all of the final numbers um, with the Army Corps of Engineers and we are our final invoice has been submitted to get the village reimbursed we are set to get $266,000 back within 30 days because I made sure that I submitted that before I left today, um, the final invoice to them. And just for reference, we had a transfer that came out of the general fund. I forget how much it was exactly. I think it was around the $200,000 mark, but the construction ended up being 258000 that the village paid for, and we're getting 266000 back. So the village is made whole plus a little bit, so that's good. And 11 years later, it's done. So yes. and I would like to thank Melissa and, and Denise as well for yes. the work that they put in on that. I mean, they spent a lot of time going through the old records, making sure everything was as it should be, and, and getting that all straightened out. So thank you very much. Good thank job. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. yes. yes. And we'll do a better job next time. Now that oh. You're on top of it, oh, right? Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> that won't happen on my watch. <laughs> okay. All right, Chief Carlson. Uh, any questions? <laughs> I, have, I have one. Um, uh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't know you weren't going to talk first. <laughs> um, I know what it is without looking. It, it, uh, your report summarizes the, the different kinds of violations and I was wondering if there's current tracking of the number of citations that could have gone to mayor's court but didn't. No, there is not. But that's something that I can remedy. So yeah, is that something that the chief should do? It, or is that something someone else should do? What, what do others think of that? It, 
Well, is it not just a simple analysis of, like, I've never seen these lists, but I understand there's like two lists. There's uh, one, if you check that box, it goes mayor's court, check that Correct. corresponding box. So where there are corresponding boxes, if... Well, it depends on the offense. Some can't, but it would be an easy stat. So I think in terms of the, some of the discussions I've heard in commissions, and also uh, in alignment with the goals that I see emerging, I think if we could begin to track the percentage that could have gone but didn't, I think it would be good to know. The I agree. Um, I'm not making excuses. No, no. But kind of been on standby and hold in the transition with mm -hmm. Mayor's Court and with Pam getting certified. Mm -hmm. um, literally, she's mm -hmm. what in her third mm -hmm. Mayor's Court. Um, we're kind of currently in discussion with Justice System Task Force on some of their uh, concepts, if you will, and Pam. We're trying to work through that. We're also talking about. Uh, creating the new teen court, mm -hmm. um, but to answer your question in general, yes, I can do a simple and say these could have been mm -hmm. submitted through mayor's court versus these. So the way I'm thinking of it isn't at this point in any way to drive behavior. I mean that could come down the road, mm -hmm. but I think just to establish a baseline, while there's no not just business as usual, mm -hmm. just to start to establish a baseline would be helpful. Absolutely. I have a question. Um, I noticed there was a certain amount of property stolen and, and this time none was recovered. I know sometimes there is some recovery. Are we um, trying to encourage folks to do things that would make recovery easier? Like I think of something simple like bicycle registration. Mm -hmm. um, keeping track of you know all your serial numbers and et cetera. Are we encouraging folks to do those? Well, the education portion of that is is up front from officers. The biggest encouragement that I can publicly announce is that for bicycles, 100% of 100% of stolen bicycles in Yellow Springs didn't have a lock. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll do it. <laughs> so that's a good start. But, right. uh, we used to have a program before my time here where you would come in, register your bike, you got a, a cool metal decal that went on the bike. It had a number. Um, I can talk with John Grody about that. That was back 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I think it's a pretty cool program. Mm -hmm. um, the mention of bicycles is kind of a hot button for me because as I was in property, bicycles are the number one kind of thorn in property and recovery because living in a community that's on a bike path, if a bike's leaning up against a tree, it's a quick route to Springfield, and then they deal with it. Great. Um, I did try to set up a communication program with Greene County, Clark County. They have hundreds of bicycles in barns. Um, last year, some of you may know this already, but thanks with Brian, and we were able to donate uh, the remaining portion of our unclaimed bicycles here to uh, a school in Springfield that actually teaches kids how to repair and build bikes. And once they're done, they get to keep it. Hmm. I think we did, what, a dozen or so mm -hmm. last year? Um, <clears throat> so to answer your question, though, I think that the education portion of that with our customers, if you will, um, is on the front end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. But uh, everyone knows the way our property policy works. If you have a bicycle that is stolen or something that you have a photograph of, we log it, we take a picture, it's in a catalog. Um, you can check with dispatch. Um, but if you do come in, fill out the report, if it's recovered and we find a match, you'll be notified and it will be returned. We have honestly about 20% from the last time I looked at it where we're returning things because most of the stuff we have isn't from Yellow Springs. Hmm. So okay. I hope that helps. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Chris Conard. Uh, the only thing I have <coughs> to add to my report, which is not taken by surprise, and tying in as well, um, is that uh, we did have a first reading on the uh, implementing the portion of House Bill 49 that is being contested. Uh, my report indicates that that uh, matter is under consideration by a Franklin County judge. Uh, the, the village is now a party in the Franklin County lawsuit. 
based upon a motion for the change of venue that was filed in the read action that was originally filed in Lorain County. The reason that's relevant is the judge has, has indicated, as my report says, that uh, he expects a decision by uh, January or February 24th. If the judge denies the preliminary injunction and nothing else happens, then the law would be effective, which means that at next council meeting, I would recommend that we pass that uh, immediately. I don't think we have to do it by emergency legislation because we have the first reading, which is the reason we did that. So we would put that, put that ordinance back on the regular agenda. Uh, if we determine that it, too much time has passed, then we would do it by emergency. And then to make it even more complicated, the city of Toledo filed their own lawsuit on the same thing uh, in Lucas County. So hmm. we're in a state of flux. Okay. Okay. Judy? I got nothing. Okay. Uh, so board and commission reports. So Kevin and Sana, like you had a nomination? Yeah, and I do appreciate you being so gracious and pulling me back from the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> when I started uh, nominating earlier. Um, so Marian, Marianne and I met with um, and had a fruitful discussion with Tim uh, Baum. He's, um, again, been in the village for short of two years and uh, he and his wife own a pretzel baking company. They have stores in Columbus and Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Yeah. yeah, And his wife just happens to be on the Arts and Culture Commission, so they're they're all in. Um, so I don't have any informa information, but I can get you his resume and whatnot. But I would uh, like to nominate him as a member of, and you've got his We've resume. Got his resume. We do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very yeah. nice one. <laughs> yeah. He very. is very anxious to get involved and be making a contribution to the village. Great. Well, the bombs are awesome, so I will second that nomination. Alrighty. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Um, any other board and commission highlights uh, that any council members would like to? Um, I, I'm sorry. I did, I did not write uh, reports and put them in the packet. Um, I do want to say that um, uh, Lisa and I at the Justice System Task Force um, let the Task force know that we would like to, we want to recommend to council making JSTF a commission of the council, and I was thinking as a process that uh, Lisa, you and I should look at the current um, uh, uh, the JSTF's uh, charter. charter charge. Sorry, I can't think mm -hmm. of the word I want. Yeah, the charge, and you know, if we we may want to make some little amendments, and I got the impression council's open to us bringing this. Right. And so then, yeah, we would have to, we would pass an ordinance, um, I think, like with our other commissions. Yeah, so, so probably in a month we could bring that to council, and once there's an agreement on that, uh, then then go through the mm -hmm. process. Um, and um, I, I'd like, apropos to that, I, I'd like there to be some thought related to the HRC in the Justice Task Force. Is I it? know there's some feelings about that. Um, that, 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 that some of the hmm. tasks of, from HRC have been taken away. Oh, or the wrong way. I think that's, that's correct. And how that would, re why, you, why you would do the ta continue the task force ongoingly as opposed to a citizen review board or some of the other forms of uh, things that other communities have set up for police community. Do so you want us to bring that as part of the what we bring? Yeah. Okay. That sounds okay. fine. And um, just to say, the energy board is talking with uh, Go Sustainable. Um, we're thinking about an energy fair uh, in terms, and then ways that the uh, village might provide some <laughs> subsidy for energy savings. Patty and I are talking about trees and. The, uh, maybe you know having starting with a, a smaller project of, of um, tree planting for the purpose of energy savings um, that maybe could become a yearly thing. Um, let's see, um, JSTF. We're working on uh, basically our work little working groups are working on kind of their work plan for the year, um, which is. 
looking at, uh, I mean, there's the mayor's court working group. Um, uh, there's looking at some of these kind of bodies that you talked about. Uh, the police working group is looking at that. And um, I'm not doing a very thorough job here. But um, the new policy project is focusing at disparate impacts on the poor. Uh, there's a book uh, titled Not a Crime to be Poor, which is something we're, lo you know, we're looking at for uh, and, you know, to be thinking about, you know, just the impacts of when you, how much money changes things if you get involved at all with any kind of problems with the uh, justice system. And your money or lack thereof has a major impact on what happens to you. So. Uh, we want to look at that and make sure we're on the, the right side of that issue. Um, I think there was a lot of appreciation for what's been going on and uh, what Chief has been doing in the police department, you know, the hiring of the outreach specialist. Of course, we're very excited about that, just like the Chief is. Um, the Miranda statement cards, the guidelines, uh, you know, highlighting the guidelines and the hiring. Um, I think all, I think, you know, we feel like what's going on is very positive and um, thinking a little more about communication uh, with the police department and I think uh, with Pam as she settles in you know kind of how we're going to be interacting uh, with her as well and um, that's about it I think. Um, the library commission went over a list of uh, repairs that need to be done, uh, and I know Johnny's going to be talking to them. Mm -hmm. um, Patty was at the meeting, and and then we're looking at probably the biggest project will be probably next year is about the uh, the bathrooms, and we're hoping we can have a unisex bathrooms versus it makes it a little easier to meet uh, the needs of the library versus having to have a women's and men's. It might may be less costly. <coughs> so that's I think. It, the main uh, oh there was a data there is a data report that uh, around just the misdemeanors minor misdemeanors and kind of what categories they were in from 2010 to 2016 it's just it's a lot of information uh, we're not quite sure you know we're hoping that can be useful in some way as we think about some of the you know disparate impacts on the poor that kind of thing so and did you have anything a separate commission I'll wait till you're yep, done I think I'm done oh just to note, just to say we are noting that the Trump administration's uh, changes at the Justice Department, it makes our job and our, you know, justice system's jobs that much more difficult. And so I think the task force, you know, sees, you know, that we're on the same side of trying to make important changes that, you know, everybody's in agreement we want to make to, to make our justice system as fair and uh, kind-hearted and compassionate as possible. Okay. Lisa? Just one quick thing in the interest of time from economic sustainability, because I, I noticed that the revolving loan fund is going to be coming up on the next agenda. And um, from the perspective of that commission, the, um, you know, the, uh, the revolving loan fund, any work it, it, that can be done is out of the hands of the commission at this point pending decisions by council about the uh, community improvement corporation and i just realized that i wasn't sure where we were as a council discussing the cic formation so i just wanted to mention that yeah that's that's what this discussion the next step will be is okay. talking about designated cic thank you so yep okay i'll bring a written report in the future all right thank you uh kevin marianne anything Okay, great. Um, so, uh, future agenda items. Uh, so, I know we talked about adding the, what was it, Judy? Cool. Uh, pool, pool, pool fees, well, the, ordinance March 1st. Yeah, the, the adult plus one. Um, cool. I, I don't think pool, pool fees will be a discussion, though, but we can have that information in the packet. But what, what I'm confused, I mean, you don't want to do Thank you for several ordinances that and that's going to be all of the same ordinance. So you don't, I mean, you would need to make that decision by no later than the middle of March because you got to enact it for this year, but you don't want two ordinances. It's all the same, all the wax. Um, well, I mean, all I've heard so far is council saying we want to have adult plus one. So um, if we need to act on that quickly, then we should 
bring that how, forward. How soon do you need it for pool season? It's got to be in effect by what May fifteenth. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. you could you got time. That's fine. I was um, going to say I would like us to when we're thinking about the pool think about the um, uh, advertising of the um, you know the swimming for all. Mm -hmm. I mean I was thinking I don't know if Danielle or some, I mean you guys need to maybe there's somebody else on the staff who could help us make a little thing that we could get out to the schools we, and we have it. Okay, we have it. Mm -hmm. You've already got it. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you guys want to report out from Melissa regarding you had asked about you wanted to know current fees, you wanted to know do you want just a just in the packet info? <coughs> I don't think it's gonna be a discussion item though. Okay. Uh, Economic Sustainability Commission annual report can roll to March nineteenth. Okay. I know that you were just you know couldn't wait on that one, but <laughs> that can definitely come off March fifth. And uh, just, I, I will not be here on March 5th. My work is forcing me to go to Wisconsin, so. Thank you. Mary Ann will be officiating. Um, okay, anything else for uh, future agenda items at this point? Report on utility roundup. Is that you, Mary Ann, you need? That's you? Yes. Yeah. Report on utility roundup. Did you want to add that? Yeah. Okay. That's what I got. All right. Oh, um, taser policy. About? Yes, sir. <coughs> taser policy on off. Move it. Um, we're having a discussion on Friday uh, with staff, uh, Ellis and I, and Chief and okay. Patty. Okay, we'll just hold it. So a bunch of folks. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So we'll, so we'll be able to make it. We should be able to make a decision then. Mm -hmm. so yes. On well, if you on the night. It's oh. a little too early to say. Yeah, yeah. we'll have Brian to wait and will see. Be aware. Yeah. Because okay. he'll be um, meeting. What about the board and commission discussion? Because Judy, Judy were you working on the document? Yeah. So is that going to be ready for March 5th? Well, it'll have to be. Yep, let's put that on March 5th. It is. What's that? It is. Yes. Yes. What an agenda. Okay. And then March 13th, we actually. Who's for us proposal? Um, it's a proposal I'm going to bring uh, to um, make the um, little park at uh, Zinia and Alamo food forest. Oh. And we may need to move uh, fees for event services to the 19th because I think the agenda is getting pretty full. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so with that, I will entertain a motion to go into executive session. I move. I second. For the purpose of? Uh, oh. Thank you. For the Wait. purpose of? <laughs> oh. The discussion of the promotion of a public official, would that be what it would be? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. So there was a who first Yes, and so we'll take a five minute break. Sorry. Stop, don't move. Stokes? I second it. Someone? I think Mary Ann moved. Yeah, Mary Ann moved. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> House. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Hampling. Yes. Stokes. Yes. Krieger. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Wow. Wow. 